fellow guys, gals, and everything else in between. And I guess possibly things on the outside. I mean, there might be other things on the outside if you're coming up. But this is something on the outside of a conversation that is going to intro right up into the intro of the intro. There's one thing in specific I wanted to talk about. I had mentioned something in this wide-ranging conversation about various topics, about the differences between what are being called the variants of the current pestilence of unknown, possibly okay to be talked about origin that has been plaguing the world for the last 17 months to two years or something. I had mentioned something that the difference between the variants, let's say the original thing that we think is the one responsible for all this current <laughs> issue is 100% something. I was stating that the variant is actually 99.99999, the same or something like that. So uh, that, that matter of magnitude was something that was completely off. And I just wanted to be very specific and come in and say the actual thing is the variance is something like 99.96 or 99.6 or something similar to it. I think the actual difference isn't necessarily as minute that I was, as I mentioned in it. And I think that's just this one thing that in there that kind of stuck out that I thought I should do this before we actually get into it. But otherwise, this is just a conversation that my friend Stephen and I had. We're not having it like the similar conversation series we had where sometimes we talk about books, sometimes we're trying to be more exact. This is more just a wine-ranging, free-ranging conversation that is similar to just the conversations that we were having online. We decided to actually, hey, let's actually call and have a talk and record it and see how it goes with it. So I hope you enjoy it. Getting into that now. What's up? This is Silas here. <laughs> Back with Stephen, we were just talking about different ways of saying hi to you, and that's in my head. But Stephen, <laughs> off to you. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're enjoying this very hot weather if you're in the Northeast right now. I just wanted to start by giving a shout out to the veterans, if any are still around, or if not, even so, of D Day. Today is the anniversary, June 6, 1944. So that's what? How many years now off the top of my head? Let's see, 20. 1944. That's like 56 plus 21, 56 plus 21, 70, 77, 77. Let's see here. Yep, correct. Uh, so uh, 77th anniversary of D-Day, the landings in Normandy. Uh, again, I wanted to just sort of give a tribute to those veterans, if you're still around. If not, memories of them. Uh, I have... I, I had a few World War II veterans in my family, but they didn't serve at Normandy. But I thought I'd mention it, very important event, a uh, major turning point in the war. So, Yeah, and I, it's interesting that we went with, you went with that intro or that yeah. <laughs> greeting because this is going to be more of just a wide-ranging yeah. conversation, mostly focused on COVID and just the, histo the history of COVID since, since, this, since the time that... Um, <laughs> I don't want to say, uh, like I might even censor that out. The the as the critical drinker says, the virus of unknown origin. But mm -hmm. now that there has been a recent change on certain discussing of certain topics and things like that, that Stephen and I might have discussed in private and other sources and places and things that we thought of, um, <laughs> we've decided let's have this conversation and just talk about our experience in it and where we are. And with this historical thing, like you know that whole end of where was the turning point? Where were the things like with D Day and um, recently, at least on the day that we're recording this, which is the 6th of June, 2021, yesterday, for example, was the day that the tank man walked across in Tiananmen Square and mm -hmm. he stood in front of the tanks, the phalanx of tanks. And then you actually look in the history of Tiananmen Square itself and that Tiananmen Square, uh, Tianan, Tiananmen Square protest, student protest, had actually began in the April of, uh, April 15th of 1989, then went all the way to the 4th. And then... It's called the Tiananmen, Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square protest or massacre or the thing. The thing that's most historical about it happened actually technically after what history considers to be the protest. Because on the 4th, yeah. when the government came in and started shutting things down, and then people think the tank man, he's, a, he's an image. He's somebody that's it's one of the most indelible images from that entire process. Yet that was technically on the day after the entire protests ended. And then over the next 10 or so days, there was various things going on that had been lost in history. And that's part of what we're discussing here, I guess, with something like this pandemic, which people would say is, I think most people would argue is much bigger of a global thing than the Tiananmen Square thing. But living in the different times that we live in, the amount of 
information that we can actually get about certain things, certain things that were said during that time, versus what will actually be remembered historically of the definitive points of that. What are the D-Days? What are the, 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 the sinking of the Lusitania? What are the situations of dropping of the A-bombs? Like when, when you have certain things historically, like the World Wars, people can look back and say, okay, this was a start. This was a turning point. This was some kind of middle. If this had gone a different way, this would have happened. And then this is the kind of the ending. Those kind of things seem to have neat packages on those sort of things. And then now you look at Tian Tiananmen Square, as I brought that up, depending on where those things occurred, if they're limited in a certain location, they can be hidden, the actual information, the principles of it. Like nobody actually identified this tank man. Like he's kind of just, there's some people who say, oh, he might have been this, might have been that. But that's due to the time that was in. 1989 is really not that long ago, if you really think no. about it. It's mostly due to the people that were in charge of the Chinese Communist Party, which are a different sort of political animal that really just shut things down. If that had happened in the United States of America, you'd have an entire bio of that man even this, that's yeah. 10, 20 years pre-social media. People would have known who that man was. But part of the reason that could happen in Tiananmen, in, in Tiananmen and not the United States of America, like Times Square, for example, or Washington Square Park, for example, is because of the nature of the people that were running that. But then now that we have the virus of unknown origin <laughs> thing, uh, for me, one of the primary things that I thought about this was this is going to be a global societal Rosetta Stone of sorts, because this is something that's affecting the entire world at the same time in a situation where we have the ability to track and get a lot of data and information from these different places and compare and contrast how different countries and different places deal with the different realities of this virus of unknown origin, as Critical Drinker says. So anyway, that whole preamble thing as a regret was just now to come and, and get into this conversation about what are the actual turning points personally for us or things that we thought of, and we might have this to be more than a single part, but just in general, what are the kind of things happening? What are the turning points? Is it the end of this pandemic now? When did we think it actually started? Versus when did it literally start? When the first is, is the start when the first person got infected is the end when the last person has been eradicated. What are those kind of figures? What are those things? How will history remember this? Are we already looking at this as a historical thing? Or are we still part and parcel in the thing? And that's this my general um, <laughs> thoughts of, of what this conversation will kind of be around. And we'll, of course, go on our tangents and things like that. But Stephen, what do you think about that meandering? Well, uh, I wanted to sort of tie it. I wanted to sort of tie it into D-Day since I brought it up, how like a lot of what people think of as D-Day is they think of the Omaha Beach landing. If you've seen Saving Private Ryan, that's what the first few minutes are. And... I don't want to trivialize the lives lost in the other beaches, but the other beach landings were very smooth by comparison. Like somebody made the comment that at the Utah beach landing, it's like cameramen watching men run into a fog and like, that's it. Whereas Omaha beach, you think of like the, the carnage just, that was brutal. I know the, there were five beaches in total. The Canadians landed at Juno. They said that was the most successful one. They advanced very far, very few casualties. And I sort of feel like that with COVID. If you think about the different areas, like you think about something like, in New York, where I am now, that was a huge hot spot. You know, the Cuomo not using the Barclays Center, or the hospital ship. And then there's other areas barely affected at all. So it's kind of a similar thing. But we always remember the worst things because of that perspective. And as you're talking about, too, the time period as well, you know, they talk about D-Day, but then there's also D-Day plus one, D-Day plus two, D-Day plus three. And I think it's a similar thing with COVID. It's like sort of like when people start hearing about the virus, that was sort of leading up to it. That was like planning overnight for the invasion and then you know the worst of it that was the invasion itself and sort of the aftermath like okay we're advancing through the french countryside and gaining ground we're succeeding but like there's still problems along the way so i sort of see those parallels i guess i mean even it's not a perfect comparison obviously but that's what i thought of just now <laughs> yeah they're, they're, it's hard to have perfect comparisons with these yeah. things and Especially when something this nebulous, and as I said, where I still think it's it's something still rather contemporary, whereas you can look into the past and you can say, okay, now that we've got this data together, you can start putting some sort of narrative to actually tell what was happening. And that still leaves a lot of things out. And we were talking about how with certain conversations, certain presentations, we've had different conversation series where we had some central 
we're reading a book or we're talking about a particular topic that gives us some guidance into things. But then even thinking about how we're presenting these things, how there's an intro at the start, then you say what you're going to talk about, then you start talking about things. We normally had chapters and things like that. And then you have an outro. There's a certain way that people are used to consuming content. And, and I, I think there's something that I think that the way people tell stories, and this is not the same in every culture, and it's not the same over time. These things have changed over time. Like you look at just movies and things like that that were made 50 years ago, and the rigor in general, the demanding what 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 the people watching expect out of the special effects, out of the writing, out of the plot holes, they don't really expect that much. You look at the religions and the stories that were told, the huge gaping plot holes because people just didn't really have those questions to come up in. They didn't need those three arcs, but the way we kind of deal with society and deal with the culture in that way, we want the villains, we want the heroes, we want to understand the plot holes. Some people might, might, might not care about the gaping plot holes. Some people want to know the minutiae of every single detail. Some people are like, oh, you brought this up. You have to tell me what happened with the rest of that person. Like, an example for the Tiananmen Square. For some people, in some cultures, in some places, they would demand an entire story of what led the man to be there. What did he say to that to the man in the tank when he climbed up on the tank and talked to them? What, who were the people who jumped in to remove him after? What has he done since then? For some people, it's just, he was there. He existed at that point. That's enough. But reality is reality. What you experience happened, whether you actually know about it or not. The little that you know, you might perceive it in a certain way, but that doesn't necessarily define what it is. So the stories we tell about reality are not necessarily what reality actually is. But the best we can do right now is tell stories and try to make some make something out of it. So I think with this conversation, I'm kind of just thinking like right now, I'm just thinking, what are the stories that have been told? What are certain stories that have fallen apart? What are the stories that will lead from this point on where it's like, okay, this is a part of this COVID story, or this happened in part because of this, like this was in the beginning and this was end, or what were the things that ended with this kind of thing? So that's kind of the structure that I think certain events like this become, um, significant or become important in the whole stories that we tell lives because it's possible and i'll make the case that there are certain people who've lived in certain areas who really didn't necessarily have covid affect their lives that much there's there's still millions of people in the world who probably have never even heard of this <laughs> virus of and of unknown of unknown uh, of unknown origin and i'm not talking about specifically just people living in untouched towns, but they could be people in some village somewhere in some countryside somewhere who just lived a regular life. They maybe talked to a few people in their town. The town still is rather self-sufficient in the food and the energy and things like that. They don't really deal with too much. They don't really have any need to be part of the global like commerce and finance systems where they're warning about, oh, this company has crashed. Now this company is going up or I need these things delivered. They're just living a simple life. And for them, has life really changed that much? But then you have some people who, what, like 10 or, was it 10 or 15 billionaires have been made who are directly yeah, related to right. uh, COVID-related stuff? Stephen himself has, has been involved in, in, some, in some of the trading and the things like that with the different things that went on when all this money was put, it was, these stimulus was given. A lot of people started investing in certain things or certain things we've talked about, like GameStop and things like that and Dogecoin and all these things. So... For some people, they're more involved directly with second degree, third degree from the actual pandemic. And for some people, they just had their lives. So what, what is more real in that sense? And I think, I don't know, what, what, I don't know if what is more well, real is the question I'm going for there. But yeah, what, what do you think? It was really interesting. I was a little late to the game on this, but I recently watched the series The Man in the High Castle. I wanted to see it when it came out, but I didn't have Amazon Prime to like a year ago, but because it's included in that, I decided to watch the whole thing. Loved the series. I watched it all the way through. I stayed up late last night actually watching uh, the end of it. Um, but I don't know if you saw you saw it at all, but one of the themes there, of course, the premise is that the Axis powers win World War II. There's various other events. So then the U.S. gets occupied, the West Coast by Japan, the Central and the East by the Nazis, and then various Americans, of course, become Nazis and basically sell out to advance in that hierarchy and, you know, better themselves. But one of the themes that if, if you haven't watched this series, I'm not going to give too much away, but um, the, it gets a lot into like sort of like parallel worlds. And that's where they get those films that show like this is the world where the allies won. This is what this character did if the Nazis had lost. This is the life they went on to live and all that. 
And one of the themes that I think is kind of interesting in that is like we talk about people being shaped by their environment versus people who stand on principles no matter what. And there's some of those themes there where there's there's somebody who like you know, in, in this reality, he's a Nazi leader, he's evil, he's going to order the next Holocaust, all this. But then in the other reality, he's just like a salesman, like raising a family. And then there's other people that um, in this in this reality, they're fighting the resistance against the Nazis. In the other one, they're fighting for civil rights. So there's a, it sort of gets into how there are certain people who will stand on principles in spite of what the environment is and always do this versus there's a lot of other people that will become completely morally compromised and just go with the flow to benefit themselves. But there also reaches a point, and again, not to give too much away, where some of the characters are like, wait a minute, am I really doing the right thing? Because on the one hand, yeah, I'm advancing, I have this status, I have this reputation, but look at what I had to do to get here, and it's killing them inside. I thought some of those themes were very interesting. Uh, uh. Yeah. And that... That is the thing, that the ideological purity mm. might be something, might be a handicap, it might be a privilege. Because when it comes down to it, and um, this is something I was talking with somebody else, uh, somebody else, a mutual friend of ours on social media, he was, he was talking about how he sees a balkanization coming in, and he was talking about it specifically like 10 years from now, which is, to me, kind of remind me of people like the Alexander Ocasio-Cortez's of the world who say, oh, the world's going to die from global warming. Yeah. But there's some people on a, on a, on, who say, say similar things that, to me, strike me as similarly sensationalist in that mm -hmm. sense. He's talking about some kind of a collapse of society of the United States of America. And I was like, what do you mean a collapse and you're talking about balkanization? I'm like, how much different is a balkanization? Like, isn't there a balkanization of sorts now? Like, what do you mean by balkanization? He's like, okay, people living more in different areas and things like that. I'm like, yeah, isn't that kind of, as we were talking about before this, we started recording, this the company town type of thing that was there before. In, in fact, part of this whole issue with the United States of America, I think that's in the West, part of the, the problems that are occurring are this forced integration and things like that, instead of just having mm -hmm. a natural things where people can decide to live in certain locations. Part of why the United States of America was so successful in my estimation is that mobility, that freedom of movement, not just freedom of speech, but freedom of movement where it's like, oh, if I'm not working, if this place isn't doing that well, I can move somewhere else and learn a different kind of uh, skill and find my way to live there. That whole crossing the borders thing, you know, that's why there's some people in America who are so seem to be, oh, just need to shut down all the borders. But most of those people are, would not be supportive of shutting down the borders when, within the United States of America because they can understand the benefits of that. So one thing I would wonder with those people is like, why could you just look at the nature of the migration within borders in the United States of America and see that that's part of, I think, what needs to come back to be more, where people just have more control and are more willing to travel and move. And there's that whole general question where people like, somebody asked me this some time back, or I have thought of this, like, why are there so many like homeless people? Like, if you're in like New York City, why would you be homeless in New York City instead of just start making your way down south to where it's like warmer, instead of having to deal with like winter in the places like that? But then the homeless people, most of them have far more issues besides being able to sit down and contemplate a plan to move down yeah. to Florida. They have certain um, mental, personal issues to deal with that, and that's what keeps them to that place. But then, just like when I moved to West Virginia and I realized for college from the D.C. area, and I was like, okay, these people are not racist. These people are not, are not bigoted. They just have lived in this one area for their whole life, and they just don't know non-multi-generational of Europeans, of um, Americans of European uh, ancestry. So they have a certain expectations and understanding and lived experience of their life, but they're willing and open to learn about new things, but they, there's no reason for them to move somewhere else and learn these new things. But if something new comes into their culture, into their environment, they are not as against it. Then I went back to to uh, Bethesda, or Bethesda, Maryland, where I was living at the time, to where I went to middle school and high school, thinking, oh, it's going to be so much different here, so much eclectic. But then most of those people moved back there and they lived in their own bubble. It was just a different, it was a bubble that was I was more familiar with and grew up in. So I didn't necessarily notice how much of a bubble it, as it was because those people came back and they had these same patterns and things like this. A little more complicated and it, it was a little meant more parts within them than the ones in West Virginia, but it's still a similar kind of bubble. So with that, there's also a similar kind of thing that I'm thinking with the homeless people. The way I think the homeless people have certain mental issues that are keeping them homeless and also keeping them to the New York City. It's also a similar thing with the more well-off people that could move. It's not, they still have mental issues and they still have other reasons outside of having the ability to simply move. 
that keep them in there. Because if you really think about it, they have more means than your average homeless person, but they seem to stay and deal with a further, a much larger reduction in quality of life than they could have somewhere else. Whereas a homeless person moving from New York City to Florida, it doesn't mean like they'll all of a sudden have all these, they'll still be homeless in Florida. So the only difference is they won't be the winter. But if you're living, if you're making $75,000 from a certain job in New York City and it's getting worse and worse, it's more and more crime, the, the apartment's getting more and more expensive, you're living in the, what, how much is, how much is like, uh, let's say you're giving $1,000 a month, What? how many square feet? For an get? apartment? Well, yeah. well, I was going to say, I mean, I, I'm in currently this tiny room, but like my rent is super cheap. I'm willing to say I pay 700 a month, which for Manhattan yeah. is like practically free. But like I live in a room that's like a box. I would pan and show, but my area here is a little disorganized and I don't want it, okay. you know. But um, but the thing is a studio like so, like somewhere around here is probably like at least two grand. And you don't get a huge place. Like I remember this um, even a few years ago, this woman I used to work with lived uh, a few blocks up. And one of my friends saw her place. He's like, it was basically a college dorm room and it was like two grand. So it's like what you pay versus what you get. Whereas like. You know, I had friends from Seattle who was like, you know, a thousand bucks there gets you like a good apartment. I mean, I don't know now if this was a few years ago, but you go to some of these places like down south. I remember one of my old um, co-workers, he had a brother in Atlanta and he had like a really nice space for like 700 bucks a month. Now, you you may look I think he had a good job. You may earn less depending. But even so, it's like what you pay versus what you get. Whereas like here you want that like, you know, like a good size studio. It's probably like. You know, I mean, I don't know, four or five grand a month more, depending yeah. where you are. Uh, uh. Yeah, and it's, those are the kind of things that, I, that I'm thinking. For if you're if yeah. you're somebody who's employed in a yeah. field that you can either keep working that same field or get a similar employment somewhere else and transfer over. Yeah, that actually, when you really think about it, it actually makes less sense that that person remains in New York City than a homeless mm. person, because the homeless person, the issues that they have to begin with, and then also what they stand to gain from the other location from moving or the amount they've actually lost. Like if you were homeless in New York City in 2010 versus homeless in New York City today, there's not too big of a difference in your quality of life, in your standard of life as a homeless person. Yeah. But if you were at a certain job making $50,000 in New York City in 2010, and now maybe you've got a few promotions and you're at $60,000, but you're still kind of living in the same neighborhood and the same kind of area, chances are there has been a certain market reduction in your quality of life in, in, in certain cases, in certain situations, especially now that you come to something like post uh, COVID post pandemic. I, I don't know. I think, I think I'm comfortable for this conversation. I think we'll, we'll call it post pandemic because things are opening up again. In my estimation, as I've thought from over a year ago, when I first heard, I never had an idea that the end of the pandemic in my mind would be a situation where the virus has been eradicated. It's going to be with humanity for the foreseeable future for future decades, just like the flu and other kind of things in there. It's a new virus that has been released into humanity that will continue to exist with us. So for the people who had in their mind that the eradication of this new virus is the end game, I don't know what to tell you. Chances are you're not listening to this video if you're that kind of person. <laughs> but, but for those out there, for them, it's good to be forever. But in my estimation, to me, the pandemic was the the human reaction to the virus to me was the pandemic rather than the actual pandemic. Because as I mentioned earlier, for some people, the virus has been here. For some people, some people get cancer, some people have AIDS, some people have never heard of AIDS, but there was a time when there was an AIDS pandemic because of the reaction and steps that humans were doing, trying to research in it, invest in it, trying to counter it, and AIDS still exists. But I don't think people would still say there's an AIDS pandemic going on because it's now become a part of the human culture. So the pandemic itself is a story. It's a story that we tell that has a start, that has different arcs, that has different stars and and antagonists and protagonists and heroes and villains and things like that. It has different things that change, little switches in the storyline and things like that. And then it has an end. So I don't think we are at the end yet. So maybe maybe it. But just for for ease of conversation, I might say post pandemic. Might say third act to the pandemic. I th I'll try to remember to say third act because I think we are definitely in the third third act, coming to some kind of conclusion of of the things. I don't know. Yeah, I guess this would be like uh, we're long past D Day. This would be like entering into Germany or something. <laughs> like I'm trying to think of yeah. some comparison. <laughs> 
So yeah, entering to Germany. So turn maybe that that would be battle like a of the Rhine side sort of thing. Are we calling Germans viruses? I don't know. Mm. I think Germans are, are an accepted group to 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 call certain things. So I, I, I don't think we'll I don't think we'll we'll get any strikes for for that for that yeah. kind of situation. Um, well, so I, I was just going to make a few points on some of what you said now. Okay. Um, what you're saying about the income and life situation is interesting because that kind of mirrors my own situation. Like, for those who don't know, I came here wanting to be a chef, so I started as a cook here. I was making very little money. Like, it like my apartment now is cheap. Like, I was still barely paying my bills on time because it's like I was making slightly over minimum wage, but it was like – I came here because this is considered by a lot of people the restaurant capital of the world. So this is where you work if you want to gain good experience. Now, it's sort of a double-edged sword because the, on the one hand, you work in the best restaurants. You learn all this stuff. But at the same time, the cost of living is so low. You work all the time. The demands on you, all that. It's like that's why a lot of people don't do this forever. For example, I graduated Culinary Institute of America late 2009 and I moved here. The bunch of other people moved from school here as well. A lot of those people are long out of the city now because they saw it as, well, I want to gain the experience and I can go elsewhere and I can have a much better quality of life. Plus, I have the experience already. So, you know, it's like I don't have to live like this forever. And for me, my situation has changed a bit because I went to working in front of the house. As we've been talking about, I got into investments. I've been doing too well. I'm not going to put out my information here. But, um, you know, now I'm trying to figure out what's my next step because, I, you know, I, I don't want to live like this forever, of course. Uh, but at, but people will say, like, oh, how do you live in this tiny place and all that? But I explained, given the circumstances at the time, it made sense because it's like I want the experience. I want to live in the city. I don't want to spend a fortune on rent. Um, I'm in the Midtown, so most of the restaurants I want to work at are nearby. So, you know, it, it makes sense given the situation. And I didn't want to be one of these people who works all the time just to have an apartment that I'm never in. And I don't want to – I didn't want to live, you know, an hour or two hours from work to have a good apartment. And then it's like – you spend all this time just working and commuting. That's not really worth it to me either. So my idea was live like this for a time. Then once things get better and better financially, then get a better place that I'm actually comfortable in living. So like, that, sorry, that I can afford comfortably. So it's not, okay, if I take some time off, I'm going to miss rent or something. So. Yeah. And I think uh, Stephen's example there is, is something that an increasing number of people can relate to at, at this time is, because there, there are certain reasons, there are certain things. Like for you, uh, one of the earlier conversations, I think we had, I don't know, I feel, did we record the, the third part or, or the last, the last most, the penultimate, penultimate, no, it was the last part, the most recent part or the latest part. I don't know what to say. The most recent part we recorded or the, one of the first conversation series we had in the UR, what you can see was about restaurants in New York City. Yeah. And I think we recorded this back in May last year. It might've been, it's over a year ago we recorded this. I, I think remember, it goes it goes back. I think it goes back way before that because I remember there was a point you were living in the city and I was sitting side by side with you recording. Oh no, no, oh, wait, this yeah, is, no when we started oh, that, it, yes. Are you talking? Oh, you're talking about the pandemic when you were asking yeah, yeah, me yeah. about what's yeah, that was about a year. I want to say that was about a year ago, yeah. I think we started the series back in 2018, if not, but then the, it was a year ago when we, yeah. I think it was after, was it maybe a couple of weeks into the, or a couple yeah. of, a month into the first. Yeah. Major shutdown in New York City, or the, specifically the restaurants. And you had been talking about if certain conditions had improved, they said they were going to reopen the restaurants in in two weeks at that time. And then here we are, a year yeah. and how many a year and how much later that restaurant? Well, it, it was it was the middle of March because I remember that was when um my my job had started shutting down, and then uh, my grandmother had passed away, and then it, my parents were like, well, why don't you just come with us because we don't know when things are going to reopen and. I think I may have said at the time too, like we thought, oh, this will be a year. Sorry, this year. This will be a few weeks. Then it was going to be Easter. Then it was going to be Fourth of July. Then it was going to be the fall. Yeah. Then it was going to be December. And I came back here a little after Easter, and things still like there are still things that aren't fully reopened. I mean, it's getting there. Like for example, some restaurants now. Um, a lot of the staff have masks, but a lot of restaurants now the rule is if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. A lot of staffs aren't wearing staff members aren't wearing masks. Uh, some of the stores here. I don't think we're at a hundred percent capacity yet but we're getting pretty close um and it's like i go out and about uh i mean i walk around my neighborhood hell's kitchen there's people out and about Times square there's a lot of people hanging out close in groups so like some have masks some don't so i think overall like i think it's interesting because i always talk about how all these regressives here you know 
suck up to the government will do everything the government tells them but even a lot of the people here are just like fuck it i don't care anymore so i think like yeah. everyone everyone's kind of at that point where like okay people aren't dropping people are hanging out in groups and people are not dropping dead left and right like why should i live in fear <laughs> uh, uh, yeah uh. Hmm. it's just how long can you hold people's attention when there's not that much new information no. that's actually being brought into it and and you see this I, and this I, happens with all stories and our lives are stories like how a tv show can't well, I guess some shows can be just the same over and over again, but they've reduced the amount of people. But yeah, yeah. What, what are you saying? Well, I was, was going to say, I mean, I have some friends in uh, Britain, too, and they talked about, I think, like, their COVID deaths now are like eight to ten people a day. Now, you can make the argument, OK, anyone dying is bad. But by this logic, we'd have to, you know, look at cancer rates, look at heart attacks, look at car crashes. You'd have to ban all those things if you were really hung up on saving lives. It's like, are you going to shut down a country because of that percentage? And I was talking to two of them, and, it was, and I was making the point how – a lot of Europeans and a lot of older school cultures, East Asians, I see the same thing. Like they're very big on deferring to authority and not questioning things. Whereas America, of course, is known for the very rebellious spirit and questioning things. Um, of course, the regressives will just call me a tinfoil hat person or whatever. But it's like there's a certain point where it's like, you know, the deaths are way down. You see people out in groups. People are not dropping dead. Um, you know, like when was the last time you heard about all these deaths? They keep talking about multiple strains, but that happens with the flu and other things anyway it's like even people who follow the government after a while kind of like wait a minute like i'm not seeing this apocalypse that i was warned about and like you know i mean why should i keep living like this just because it doesn't make any sense uh, uh. yeah and with some of these strains some of these things whenever you look into the actual information what is the actual difference between the strains and it's something like 0.0001 percent or 0.00 i think it was 0.001 percent where it's like okay the initial strain was ninety, was one hundred percent this, and another strain comes out that's only that's like nine ninety nine point nine nine four different. So it's it's the the actual amount that actually changes between these ones that are being called strains is nowhere close to the actual language that used to be called before. And this is something that that we've seen that I noticed earlier was like these people are talking it up to. It's being talked up to such a level that the expectations you. For you to match those expectations, like one of the earliest things that really got people in a tizzy from it coming out of the UK was the uh, uh, King's College thing. I think that thing that yeah. talked about, oh, in the United, in the United States of America, we're going to have 2, 2.1 million deaths. And you actually read the article and I actually went and read most of the paper of, of that actually claimed that. And it's just completely wrong. It was inaccurate. Certain general assumptions of, okay, first of all, we're thinking we're going to do that's based off of a projection off of very limited information and assuming that people just sit on their hands for the next year and do nothing at all when that is there's complete no that never happens those kind of situations never happen that is a very common thing when it comes from the the scientification of of the of the global social political ex social political social economical conversations where people go to these studies and they say okay just quote this in this one environment this would work. But as we mentioned, that's a story being told. If we were writing a story and humans weren't human beings like they are in reality, and they were working to the parameters in this story, then two million uh, Americans would die. But yeah. since humans are not, we're not characters in some story, people are going to change, people are going to adjust. Even if the virus was as virulent as that thought, people would get PVV. People would realize once it gets up to about even the most dumbfounded, like most obstinate people would realize when it gets to a certain level of threat that they will actually do the things that would reduce that threat. Then, of course, there's the people doing the counters, there's the treatments, there's the projections. There's... Even that person didn't even account for the virus itself changing and viruses and things do change. There's just so many to go into. And so those expectations that were set to that level, you have so many people in culture, in society, who were just teed up to a certain high level of stress and expectation. And then they get out there and all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, things are things are nowhere close to as bad. And I think part of the negative of that, for some people, they were expecting such high levels of danger that they overestimate or they might ignore the actual level of danger there. I think it's better to have people understand the appropriate level of danger because people are like, if it's not that bad, then I'm not going to do anything. Whereas yeah. if people understood, okay, it's this, it's this is bad enough. So let's adjust this bad enough. Because once you get people expecting a lion, then you bring like some house cat, they might not 
treat the house cat with a per- proper concern, even though the house cat might have rabies and be like really scratchy and bitey. Yeah. But because they were expecting a lion, they might not care that much about the house cat. But that's not the, the greatest analogy. You might take a better <laughs> one. <laughs> but, but I think there, there is some of that in there for some people. But of course, there are the people who are just triggered, who since you put them up on such a high level, there's almost no information that you can actually give them to bring them down off yeah. of that level of just fear and and fear and loathing in in pandemicus. Pan, I was thinking about fear and loathing that Las Vegas thing. That's that's another uh, graph, right? Stop doing these. <laughs> Stop doing this already. Write them down. Think about them. Okay. So anyway, I think we were talking about the restaurants. You talking about yeah. that? We said that was like over a year ago. We talked about that. You yeah. were talking about how you moved to New York City in order to have because you wanted to be a chef. You want to do that. Yeah. Things have changed in part Do you, you're one of those people who the last year of your life has been very tied in living in one of the epicenters. I'm living in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm also in my, my same room here. You might've seen some changes if you've been following our conversations in Steven's location and things like that, but it's been this room for me. <laughs> and it was this room for me due to my, my choices in the way that I live and certain privileges that I have to just be able to not really interact too much with the outside world. Certain decisions I've made that I've limited. I'm coming out to that now, looking forward. But with Stephen, he's been in the epicenter. For me, my life didn't really change that much post-pandemic. The only really thing that changed for me is a few t- on my daily walks when I decided to actually go into buildings. I normally go buy food or things like that, or sometimes I go to some public areas. I used to carry my, a mask with me. So that's the only thing that really changed for me. But some of the stores used to open and close at different times. There were some um, few shutdowns. And oh, there's somebody who lives in the same housing complex that I, I live in, same area, the living area who had COVID, so might discuss that in a later time or later in here. But I didn't get it. Uh, nobody, my immediate relatives got it. I don't know anyone directly personally that has died from it. But Stephen himself, he was one of the people who was main in that story. So I might have been someone who technically, if I wasn't online so much, my life personally wouldn't have changed too much if I'd never actually heard about it. You could have told me it was something else entirely and my life wouldn't have changed. So I'm kind of one of those people. But Stephen, you've been directly affected by this on, in a very real real sense in your your your, rel- your, your location where you live, uh, your, your, um, your work, the people that you're around, as you said, one of the epicenters. So if you can just kind of just tell us a bit about that, maybe you just, we'll, we'll converse sure. more into that into the, as, as we explore sure. that. Just the things that have kind of happened since we talked to that idea of opening. And then first question, is that restaurant open yet? What, where, where I worked? Yeah. No, um, I think it, I think it may be permanently closed. In fact, it's, um, I, you know, I, I, it's, it was kind of a, an unusual situation because what happened was, it was shut down um, when this whole thing started. And then it was like, I did wonder if they were thinking about closing because we had to turn in our keys and stuff. And then they talked about doing stuff with the interior. And I reached out to my old boss and I was like, is the place going to reopen? And she kind of said, oh, we're not sure. We'll see how things go. But then I walked by and there's a for sale sign. Now, the thing is, there was some, what some people have said is that some um, – some landlords are putting out for sale signs to see like what prices they can get for the buildings. <laughs> and that, that no, because that's the thing. But the thing is what the restaurants aren't necessarily, of course, you know, they're renting the building. They don't own the building, but in, in the case of my job, the, my boss owned the building. So if it's for sale, she's the one who's selling it. That's the thing. Now, it could be, you know, another theory was that she wanted to see what price she could get. And if she can't get a good price, she'll reopen. Um, I guess that's possible, but it, it seemed kind of, I don't know. I, I, it just seems like extra steps one. And then what was a little strange to me was the fact that there was no formal announcement about closing. Cause this was, this was her flagship and it had been around almost 40 years. So it was a little like, I get because of the pandemic, like things didn't pan out as expected, but it was a little strange. There was no formal, like, okay, we regret to announce after this long, we're closing. Um, what a lot of places would do if they could, I mean, they can't really now, but a lot of places will have like a last hurrah where there'll be like a final week where like they invite everyone to come in and we'll do like, signature dishes and things again you can't hear because the place has been uh shut down and you know the staff is pretty much scattered but it was just kind of unusual but then there were other places where um 
I walked around and it was like, you know, the places I'd been to for a while that had closed. But I mean, they, it makes sense. I mean, places just couldn't afford to stay open. They couldn't afford to pay rent with no business. Some of these bigger groups were able to survive because they had other sources of income. So they're basically paying the rent to keep the places afloat. And once they can be open again, they will. Um, there's a few places I like that aren't going to open to 100 percent capacity. Um it's you know it's kind of a shame, but at the same time, like I'm glad they survived and like they're not going under. Um, I I don't know how it's gonna work with staff in these different places because where I worked, like everyone just kind of scattered because everyone was kind of like, okay, we don't think the place is gonna reopen, so let's move on. And uh, I've been discussing with my family, like even if my last job were to reopen, I mean everyone's gone at this point. Like a few people moved away, other people have other jobs. It's like you can't put your life on hold waiting for a place to reopen. I mean it's been a year. At some point, it's like you have to move on. Um, it's a shame, too, because, I mean, there were some people who were there for um, – I knew some people who were there for a decade, even two decades, but it's like – I mean, what can you do? It's like if they don't want to reopen, they don't want to reopen. I mean, you just have to move on. Uh, any thoughts or comments before I say anything yeah. else? Uh. As, as you mentioned, with when you're talking about the, the man in the high tower, which my brother has, has a lot of good good things to say about that show, but probably never going to – I'm probably never going to watch it. I, I've, yeah, just, I recommend it. I, I, but it's just for, for me with my intake. It's mostly if I'm going to do visual stuff, it's only movies, and oh, uh, more in like audiobooks. <laughs> I have a long list of audiobooks and things like that I want to get into. I'd also want to get into more like actually writing and creating my own story. So I find like when I'm, if it's a series, that's that's a lot of time. And also again, we mentioned the part of the structure of the series. Some series, due to the nature that the stories are still told on that platform, is it'll be like a 35 minute or like th let's say say it's a 60 minute show. In most of them, the first 10 minutes is recouping the things that happened in the previous yeah. one and setting up and bring characters back in. And then then you get like a middle part of the actual story and then they tie in the stuff at the end to like set up the next one. So that whole part of it, I prefer watching certain shows now are going more to that mode where it's like a really long movie where they'll set it up and like very little of that. It's kind of intended for the binging. And something like, um, I think the most recent show that I watched that was like that, I think was embracing that new kind of uh, technique of it, is um, was um, Queen's Gambit. That one didn't really seem to have too much of like, oh, we're recouping what happened. It's like you're intended to watch this thing like as a really long movie. So Man in the High Tower, that was uh, th three seasons Man, at least? Right? Man in the High Castle. It's, uh, Man in the High Castle. It's, uh, yeah, it was four seasons. It was from yeah, 2015 two. to 20. 2015 to 2019 like i said i was late to the game because it was one of those things that like that. what's that like i don't have time for that <laughs> well, but, it, but it was it was one of those things where like i because originally like i was debating on getting amazon prime and i didn't but then like when I, once i saw that it was free with my subscription i'm like well i might as well watch it okay. and um i mean i'm a huge history buff especially world war ii i love alternate history it was a lot of time though it was one of those things where i stayed up a few nights watching it and i was like oh wow it's like two or three already um yeah. i mean i i loved it personally but yeah it, it does take time out of you whereas that that's what people have discussed the whole thing with series is like where it, it's like it used to be like something like 24 is like my mother and i would watch it once a week but that's what happened it was like you'd watch it for like an hour then there'd be like the season premiere season finale i think that'd be like two hours but that was like a once a week thing whereas now there are people who will just binge watch entire series like all at once and like yeah. I, i'm generally not a fan i mean i was hooked into this that's why i kept going but it's like there are people who will just like binge like a series and binge another series binge another series and i don't know it's just like I mean, it's entertaining, but there's a point where, like, I don't really see it as being worthwhile use of time yeah. unless it's, like, you know. I mean, doing it that much, like, that's what I've said before about people talk about, like, oh, video games rot your brains out. I'm like, okay, well, what do you say about people who just binge watch series after series? You're not really learning anything. You're just read it, watching someone else's script. Now, like I say, there's nothing wrong with doing it occasionally. I mean, there are good stories, but it's, like, I don't know. It's, like, th those are the kind of people that are just passive and kind of – it's like they, they go along, they'd rather be like a passive watcher than active participant. Did you ever see, um, there was a South Park episode about PewDiePie and that whole gaming thing? I so don't that, think, was it Gamergate, was it about that? I, I don't know. No, 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 that was another one. This one was about um, how PewDiePie got such a following and how he made all this money and got all this attention just like recording videos of himself playing games and commenting on them. And there was a point where Ike, that's Kyle's younger brother, he and his friends were just sitting on their iPads watching PewDiePie. And Kyle's like, guys, we have call, we have Call of Duty downstairs. Why don't, you go, why don't you go down and play it? And they're like, PewDiePie, PewDiePie. They just want to watch him do it. <laughs> and, then, and then one of the themes in the episode is that 
Cartman starts doing the same thing, but they do the same effect with the show where Cartman's face shows up in a screen on top and starts commenting on everything. Everyone's just like, what is happening here? <laughs> so, but it, like, it's kind of like that though. Like there's a certain, I don't know, there's certain people, I guess who would rather just passively watch other people comment on active things rather than do the things themselves. I mean, I don't know. I, I've never really watched PewDiePie much. Like maybe he's entertaining. I can't say, but I, that, that just it doesn't really appeal to me. Uh. Well, he has his appeal, of course, to to a, a significant number of people yeah. online in his own way. But that's that's not something that I, I don't really understand his appeal either. But although with certain things, I'll be able to watch like people. I there's some channels I watch people gaming who game in the yeah. background. But I think that that kind of touches on to the thing you're talking about with the storytelling. People like stories, so it's kind of they they that whole idea of somebody giving a narration of what's going on. And that's how we kind of operate in life. We walk around life and live our lives and have a narration of what's going on rather than what is actually going on, rather than actually participating. So it goes kind of to what, um, uh, we've talked about this before, but you you gave me that link of vocal distance and James Lindsay talking about it, where the guy put it in a really excellent way when he's talking about the strawberries, how there's like a similar oh, yeah. object where people are used to that. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's like- Hyper reality, it's, it's yeah, called. It's, it's a take on a take on a take on a take. So it's yeah. not necessarily, because I remember when I, we were gaming as kids, of course, sometimes we'd get stuck in a game and there was still a time when, I, I'm, I think I'm like five years older than you, but it's still, I think we're still around in the same kind of group. Yeah. You started playing games before there was like these online sources of games. So you'd go on like game facts or you'd have to get the actual magazines that had the actual walkthroughs of it and you go into them and get yeah. the details. I used, to, but I now used to do those. Yeah. Now to me, it's weird. Like people will watch somebody play the actual game that they're going to play instead of learning it on their own or trying to figure out those things on their own, they'll, they'll just go buy the walkthrough that they saw somebody play and then go themselves and do the same exact thing that person did. And like, wasn't part of the enjoyment of gaming being like discovering these things for yourselves. Like people go in and read the spoilers. I'm like, what are you doing with this? But, but anyway, yeah, okay. <laughs> so the, the reason I, I was bringing that up was the show back then you were talking about the alternate realities, the alternate times and things like that, how they show somebody in this in this life and then you go to a different reality. This person is doing this based off of different things in their life. Yeah. And we were talking about how New York City, how you went there to, because it was the restaurant capital. And then now, is it going to be the restaurant capital again? If it was, let's say the pandemic had happened back then when you were thinking about moving, let's say you were still in school or you were a kid at that time or you, you hadn't began that process or let's say you were somehow transferred into now, and this was you coming out at that point right before you decided to move to New York City, would New York City in its current state still appeal to you as a restaurant capital for you to come there kind of having in mind already? Because I think you had the mindset already that you would take certain certain sacrifices or make certain decisions and exchanges, um, cost-benefit analyses to say, yes, I will live in a smaller apartment because I have access to the restaurant capital of the world. So would New York City right now, what are the things that made you choose New York City at that time? Do those things still exist right now? Like, would you think somebody in your position, in your mindset, would you advise them to come to New York City right now if they wanted to live the same kind of life or projection or expectation intention that you had at that time? It's a little, I mean, it's a little nuanced, but what I would say broadly, probably no, because the thing is, I mean, I do think there still are great restaurants here, and I think there will be for some time. I think one advantage, though, is that because a lot of people have worked here, gained skills, they've gone elsewhere and opened restaurants, so the quality of restaurants elsewhere is improving a lot. Like, that that happened with, uh, well, I mean, Portland's not in great shape right now, but um, that happened with Portland and Seattle, where a lot of people would work here, they'd become sous chefs or chefs, they'd go out there or open their own restaurants, but because... At the time, the food scene there was kind of eh. So if you opened something good, you really stood out. But because you had that experience, so you stood out. But now it, it's a good thing in a way because it kind of feeds on itself because those people bring that great experience. They have great food. People study under them. They open their own places, and they just keep building. And I remember there was a chef at culinary school. He was an older German guy. He's probably like 70 now. He even said, he's like, you guys are a lot more talented than I was at your age, which shows really how far the industry is progressing. And I think the overall trajectory is up. I just think the challenge here is all the stuff going on as we were talking about with homelessness, with crime, uh, people leaving. I mean, I agree a lot with Michael Malice. I think like like longer to like mid long to like longer term, the city will recover. It'll take a different state for sure. Because I think the other aspect of this with being the restaurant capital is that it, the demographics as far as finance matters, like you're not going to open a place like per se in the middle of nowhere. It's like you're, you're they're like. 
if you the French Laundry, it's funny. I, well, it's funny I'm saying this because the French Laundry they say kind of is in the middle of nowhere, like it's all there is in that town. But the thing is, it's in Napa, and there's other towns nearby. There's people with money. There's ways to get there, all that. But if you were to open it like middle of nowhere in like Iowa or West Virginia, it's like, I mean, aside from a handful of people who aren't going to eat there all the time, you don't have much to rely on. And it's like, you're not going to get people to go all the way out just for that place. I mean, you would have to do something above and beyond. And at that point, it's like, why go so far away from everyone else anyway? So I, I would not recommend, you know, people who want to learn the industry come here right now. Like I said, maybe longer term, it's good. I think the city will take a different state as far as a lot of these jobs, people are leaving, but of course, there's still the entertainment here. There's still universities here. They're talking about converting offices to apartment buildings that could lead to cheaper rent. Um, the city will take a different form. It will bounce back, but it's it's like people talk about New York coming back. I don't think it's going to come back per se. It's just going to alter, be altered in some way. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's something in 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 reality you don't you don't have the ability to see how life is and exist in multiple yeah. alternate realities. Yeah. It's There was a reality of New York City that was going on a certain track and then the pandemic came and what exists after is going to be separate. When in TV shows, it's like, oh, we jump off to this reality for an episode yeah. or for 15 minutes and then we come back to this older reality and you go back in. But that's not happening. And I think no. because this is the kind of storytelling that people are used to having, people think that, oh, that was just a jump into an alternate reality. Now I'm just going to come climb back into the older reality and things will come back. No, it's that's 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 not how things work. And and I think even more so with those kinds of stories is because those kinds of stories understand people that they come back to that reality and now it helps them inform how they think about that reality that didn't have that reality. But to them, since they're experiencing the story of the man in the high high castle, castle. for example, yep. they they don't realize that those characters that come back, yes, it's the same actor, and, but within that, that, that universe, that other character never, in that universe, do they have those other characters actually see those alternate realities or is it just the yeah. viewer seeing them? No, they actually go, there's, uh, I'm trying to think how to explain it without giving too much of the show away. It starts off with certain characters have visions into the other universes and they find a way to actually go to those other parallel worlds. And okay. then, it's interesting because you see these these people who came from the universe where the um, the Axis powers won, and they they see America with like six. It, it takes place in like sixty two to sixty four, so it's like they see like way JFK is president now, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, we're talking about invading Vietnam. Um, I like there's a scene where one of the Japanese characters um, he goes into the, in the cupboard in his house in this other reality. He finds Twinkies. He doesn't know what they are. He picks them <laughs> up, sniffs it. He puts it on his plate. He gets chopsticks and eats it. It's like there's things like that because because they say they're like I saw San Francisco, but it was much different from the one we live in. Whereas in their reality, it's you know the rising sun flags everywhere. Japanese culture is mandatory. You know it's like. But it's like they're so used to their world and then they see it and then like then our world is strange to them. But then they've also wondered like, wait a minute, is this world possible? Is this world better? Is it worse? There's some interesting themes with that for sure. You know? hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is what I'm saying. Like I don't have time for that. I need to get to like yeah. write the story yeah. that I thought I was going back and clearing out some things out of my computer and looking back and see like, okay, I had actual stories from 2007 talking about traveling to different realities and then many shows have absorbed that into it but anyway so what i was saying was like with the scripts they're able to go back because in that world it's written that this world exists separate from that world so you can learn something from that other world and come back to this world separate but then i was thinking is that truly inaccurate because as we'd mentioned for some people the the, the virus has existed some people, the danger of the virus is a danger. Where the virus came from, it came from where it came from. Whether you, you think it was a pangolin, whether you think it was a wet market, whether you think it was a leak from the lab, whatever you think, it actually happened, regardless yeah. of your perception of it. But due to your perception, are you technically living in a different reality? Like, as you mentioned, some people were fearful of it, and then they came out and then realized that fear wasn't there. But that entire time, they had that fear that level of danger never really existed. But while they thought it existed, they were living in that reality where it, in they were living in a perception of reality. Their ideas, their idea, their ideology was informed by a set of, of, of percep, was it a set of perception or preconceptions? 
It really messes thousand. with your head. It really messes with your head, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's like the reality is reality. But so I'm kind of wondering, can you technically? Like, I I don't know. It's like some of the people were in there, but there's I think there's some things. Once you come out of something, you can't go back to that thing. But you can get into other things, and this is part of what Autumn's saying. The, the reality of New York City as the restaurant capital of the world that you thought of that time at that time existed or it didn't exist. It was true or it wasn't true. But now, in reality, those things that informed that no longer exist. And at this time being, they they won't necessarily just come back in that kind of sense. So I, I don't know. It's it's a it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing. To well, think. I would also say with New York, I mean, it also had to do with the recent governments. Because the thing is, like, Giuliani really cleaned up New York. And, like, Bloomberg, I disagreed with a lot. But, like, the city did pretty well under him as far as, like, the budget. Crime was low, all this. So it was maintaining it. But then, of course, we get de Blasio and, you know, how he is. It's like... Oh, well, tax the hell out of the rich. They leave. Oh, well, no big deal. Uh, the, the police, I'm not really sure what's going on with, though, because like like I say, they talked about defunding them, but I feel like I see more police than ever. So I wonder if that was more to sort of like placate the activists, but in reality, they're not doing it. Um, yeah, it's weird because it's like I feel like I walk around like Times Square. I see police. You know, I remember walking through Chelsea, police, Washington Square Park, police, subways. I see police like I feel like I'm seeing police everywhere. So it was one of those things where they're like, oh, yeah, sure, we'll defund them. But in reality, they didn't. Maybe. I don't know. It's like on some level, they know there's crime and things and they don't want the city to fall apart. But that cat's out of the bag a little bit, plus the homelessness issue and things. But it's like. You can't just go around like arresting all these homeless people and putting them in like a prison or something. Everyone's going to be like, you know, what are you doing? And the activists here are going to make us think about that. So I think it's kind of a delicate situation. I mean, I think they say that the city is resilient and I think it is to a point, but it's like I, I try to make the point to people. It's not invincible either. I mean, Detroit was the Paris of the West. There used to be the highest per capita income in the country was in Detroit. Yeah. Look at Detroit now. It's like Nothing says this has to be forever. I mean, financial institutions are leaving, computer-related stuff, they're leaving, people from here moving to Austin and elsewhere. Like, nothing says this. the city has to be great forever. I mean, I think people just, they take too much for granted and they don't realize all these issues we're talking about, like the outsourcing, but also, like I say, with restaurants, people are just opening restaurants elsewhere, cost of living elsewhere. Like, nothing says the city has to be what it was, like, 90s, early 2000s, forever. I mean, there's there's nothing guaranteeing that. And I think... The mistake people make is they think that's somehow guaranteed. Oh. Yeah, and that, that is a relation. It's, huh. as you mentioned, you went there to work because it was the restaurant capital in part. Yeah. But people were also opening restaurants there because it was the restaurant capital in part. And yeah. they understood that people like you would come there with that yeah. intention to do that. But then, you, as you mentioned, with um, with uh, the French laundry, and we also have a conversation series where we talked about French laundry and stuff. It was yeah. an interesting one, but all, all of our conversations are interesting in my, in my, in my humble estimation. <laughs> but um, so with, with that, with that, like she might, the, the owner of the restaurant that you worked at, she might also look and now have that consideration and say, even with her memory, she might be like, wait, when I had to shut down, I heard Gavin Newsom was still at the French laundry that was very still open. <laughs> <laughs> in part because it was in some remote town and things like that, they could handle the adjustment to these kind of conditions. Like there was, it wasn't a situation where now 95% of the people who normally come to that restaurant were unable to come because the people who were going there were people who were traveling and planning ahead anyway. So she might, she and many other people in her position might not look into it and be like, Hey, um, I know some of the, maybe the main chef that was working at their restaurant decided since we're not working right now, I'm going to move back to the town that I live in or I have some friends, I'm going to live there and stay there for a bit while I'm here or no, while, while waiting for the place to reopen. And then while he's there, he might decide to work at the restaurant, he might just be cooking at his house. But then they, they get into the talking with the owner and they're like, look, I'm already here. This is a nice enough neighborhood. It's close enough. And why don't we just open something here, open some stand or open some, some kind of thing and do this kind of thing. And I think people are now especially with the drive that now people have to reopen the, the country and reopen places. A lot of people are now marching used to like, oh, I have to drive a little longer to, to go to this place. There's, there, I think a lot more people would now be willing to drive two hours to get to a restaurant that before in the past were so used to the, them being so many restaurants open right by them that now they can say it's an outing. You know, I don't have to do this thing where I have to travel to France because there's a few good restaurants there. When you know well and good enough that a couple of towns over, like 45-minute drive, an hour drive away, there's a pretty decent restaurant there that has the food. And I think people might be used to that. And that might be one of the things that I see 
with restaurants happening, it seems to be something that could work with restaurants in a pretty decent way. People might be living in a cheaper way. There's a lot of turnaround with uh, people who work at restaurants at not the highest levels, right? But the lower levels, people come in and then they move out. If somebody is willing to live in a situation like you're in right now, in a yep. small room in New York City, I think there's a lot of people who might be in the, with a similar skill set as you as you are that would be able to be like, oh, I need to move to a small town in in Ohio because there's a really good restaurant there that I can go there and get some experience. And at the same point, the amount of money that I'm making there will afford me an actual house with a yard, <laughs> like outdoors and things like this. They they might be a situation where that happens with restaurants and other businesses as well might start going to that kind of company town type of um, arrangement that used to exist before <coughs> fiat currency really came into the actual... I don't want to blame... I, mean, I like blaming things on fiat currency, but I don't know how much on fiat currency this is. But it was more a recent thing with people feeling we have to be in these centers of commerce in order to have certain things. Yet in the past, in the I guess the industrial times, it was more of that thing where it's like, there was a company here, there was an industry. And it, you didn't say that. You said that before the conversation where even like IBM, you said part of the reason yeah. you were born in yours is because your dad moved there because yeah. of IBM. And we talked about Silicon Valley and things like that. Now, um, we saw what recently happened when Amazon tried to have an office in New York City and, and Alexander Ocasio-Cortez and some other people booted them out and then they decided to move somewhere else maybe in Baltimore or something. But yeah. this is happening more. I think now that people are, are opening companies, opening opening, uh, opening companies, opening businesses, starting entrepreneurship, working themselves in different ways, what do you think is going to happen with that kind of environment of the attraction to come to New York City? How many people will decide, in your estimation, do you feel would say, instead of reopening in New York City, let's go somewhere else? Or maybe they were they had ideas and things like that, and they realized there's certain legalities and things in New York City that the the drive of places like New York City is not worthwhile enough to go through those hoops and things like that in order to start there. When I can start somewhere else and still have some sort of success that might not be the New York City type of idea of success, but still one that's valid enough to actually run a kind of company and existence in life. I don't know. All right, so I actually have several points on everything you just said. So as far as the state of my last job, it's actually an interesting situation because the um, the executive chef was actually a part owner. He was an investor. So what happened is when the place closed, he was granted a post in one of the other restaurants, which is still open. Now, my um, I, I don't know what was agreed upon, but my guess would be because if he was an investor and he had worked with them for so long, it's like they kind of owed him something. So it's like, okay, we'll make you chef at one of the other places, which still seems to be doing well. I'll probably go in there for dinner soon. It's actually, uh, it's a block south from where I used to work at Netta, interestingly enough. Uh -huh. Um I ate there once, really good. Uh, Babo, it's called, if you're familiar. That was one of Mario Batali's uh, bigger places, like early big places. But when the whole scandal happened with him, he got they bought out. Yeah. So he what happened was my boss was partnered with him. And what happened was when the whole scandal happened, he got bought out, essentially. So they just took okay. over his places. So it's like they they own that place now. Well, like before it was divided, but now it's like fully theirs. So the chef was given a, a job there because it's like, well, you know, you worked for us for so long. You're an investor. You know, we kind of owe you um, really nice place. I want to go in soon. But I was going to say it's interesting with my boss because I think she's about 72 now or so. She opened this place in the early 80s, but she opened it with, at the time, her husband, because that, that's actually where the name comes from, uh, Felidia. Is, it's a play on Felice and Lydia. It's the two names put together. And um, also with her mother who passed away recently. Her mother was 100, though, so, um, you know, she's been out of it for some time. But, um, you know, it was a family-oriented restaurant, and then I know she and her husband divorced. Um, then she just took it over completely. He passed away, I think, like 2009, 2010. The mother, of course, like I said, she she was working there like up until her 70s. They said it was pretty crazy. Um, very tough lady. But, you know, it, towards the end, she was pretty frail, as you can imagine. She needed a lot of help. She passed away. But um, my boss, she still has her show. She still has these other businesses. They own Eataly as well. That's like a few restaurants plus a market. That's in uh, Flatiron, not too far from where you live. Um, yeah, exactly. so it's like, she, she has enough income coming in. Plus she's older. So it's like, she, I, I'd imagine she's at the point, like she's not looking to expand. She's just kind of maintaining what she has. And then I, I don't know if when, and if she'll retire, if she's one of these, who's going to just keep working until she can't, I, I'm not, you know, sure of her motives, but I think she's kind of at the point where it's like, she's not fighting to keep what she has afloat. She's not probably not looking to open new places. It's like, 
what's the point now? I mean, she has presumably the money she needs. You know, she probably doesn't want to work much longer. I know physically it's getting harder on her, of course, the show and plus traveling and stuff. So she's probably at the point where she's like, okay, just maintain what I have, ride it out, retire, you know, whatever. And um, as far as turnover, it depends. This rest, this restaurant industry in general has high turnover. As you kind of mentioned, the lower positions, there's a ton of turnover because what it is is people – they they work in certain places. They think they're going to work their way up. They don't get what they expect, so they leave. Where some of the people who get the good places, good positions, will stay in places a while. So like one of my friends worked at Danielle. Danielle is one of the other top restaurants here, and he said that some of the cooks and sous chefs that are in the higher positions, they're there like three five years plus. But like all the apprentices and things, there there's like a new one like every few months because it's like you come in, you just peel vegetables or other tedious stuff. And then people don't advance and they're, yeah, and they're like, well, I'm not going anywhere. I, I, I'm going to leave. Whereas these other people have good positions are like, I'm going to keep working. But they say it's an interesting thing with advancement where you're like, you're at the bottom. It's very tough to advance. But once you make it, they say you jump through the stations pretty quickly. So my friend was like, he, um, he worked in one of the other restaurants with me. That's how I met him. And he eventually got on the line and he jumped around. He ended up becoming sous chef there. So sous chef at Danielle, that's a really solid position. Then he moved to California. I think that's where his wife is from. And then he, uh, you know, he's an executive chef now, but he has all that New York experience, including sous chef at Danielle. So of course that's going to carry him pretty much wherever. Um, the restaurant scene to sort of elaborate on your point. What I was going to say with that is, a lot of it here is the concentration of restaurants, and that's something my dad always said to me. He's like, well, you live in a place where you can go down the street, knock on the door, and get another job. And, like, there is something to that because, like, my first job was oh, it was across from Lincoln Center, like, uh, several blocks up. It's, like, 63rd and Broadway. So if I were to go out onto 8th Avenue, just follow it up, it would merge into Broadway, and that's where my job was. And then my second job in the city was 58th, but second – what was it? uh six and seven so it's like if i walk like diagonally like up and over so it was like about the same distance just different direction and then Felidia, my last job was 58 second and third so i do have to go up a bit and like all the way across by the roosevelt island ferry but even um even by walking it's maybe like half an hour so it's like it's the concentration of all these restaurants here whereas the challenge is if you're in a small town you have like three four or five places and that's like that's why I didn't get certain people like from my area who stay in the area and they work at like one or two places forever. It's like, I, I mean, I guess loyalty, maybe you, they pay you more over time, but it's like, you're not going to learn a ton just staying in one restaurant, in one small town. Whereas here you have the option of working in various high end restaurants. And Thomas Keller, if you read about his career, he spent, it was like a year or two trailing uh, in all these various like top restaurants in Paris, like a few months in each. So it's like, he learned all these techniques, all these recipes, and he integrated aspects of all this different, these different, chefs and like he sort of built his own brand his own um you know his own style of cuisine out of that so it's like it's a challenge you have to find that midpoint of you don't want to bounce around too much because then people think you're unreliable and disloyal but at the same time you stay in one place forever you kind of stagnate too it's like you need those different skills and uh techniques see how different businesses are run and combine the best of best of all of them and then that's how you build your own successful brand sure okay so but then again, again, it comes back to there's there's, there's definitely support some parts of the restaurants is if you're going to make certain restaurants, sell certain food, you're going to need certain clientele that can afford to actually come there to to just make profits. Otherwise, you're not running a business that works. Uh, so that's that's one of the aspects. But as I mentioned, now the people are more willing to travel and move. Like, what would it take for you? For example, if the person who the 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 lady was running the restaurant that you that you work at, if she said, "Okay, I'm opening a restaurant in in like uh, the the suburbs of like or somewhere some town right outside of like Cleveland, Ohio, and I'd like you to to go and do the same job you're doing here, but do it over there," what what kind of incentives would would it take for you to like, okay, now I'm going to do this? Because I'm wondering if that's something that now, because we we do know a lot of businesses have already relocated from. New York City, and they normally carry a lot of their same employees. I think was even somebody that um, somebody uh, Louis Ruckman. He's he has a channel. I think it's Louis Ruckman, Louis Ruckman or something. And he came. It was a time around the GameStop time. He came up and he had a really good uh, expl explanatory video of what was happening in GameStop. I think you shared it with me, and then that that really it became very viral on YouTube. And he did a couple of videos on that. But he had a YouTube channel talking about different issues in New York City, and he's a Mac repairman. He's had, let's say, rather successful channel, but he stayed on. 
But he was living in New York City, and he was talking about how him living in New York City has a lot of people. He has his, his office, he has his employees and things like that, people he knows who work well. And he has a process, of course, millions of people living in New York City, a lot of the people with Apple. So he has a lot of actual um, people who would need his services. And for some time, he was talking about, should I move? Like, all the cost, I have all this here, have all this pot and rest in this kind of thing. And I think finally he's decided he's going to move, and now he's kind of doing his moving process. But he'll move and he'll say, okay, anybody that I'm working with, if you want to move with me, I'm going to carry you guys along. So is that something that you think might happen with some of these restaurants where now that in the past, the people with the big money, the big investors of restaurants, they understood the X's and O's of doing it in the big cities because you can kind of pitch that. But now if there's an increase and chance of, since you're not working with anything, you have to start from scratch with a lot of these things, you don't have as much of the momentum, how much of that could happen? What kind of incentives do you think would actually lead to people in your field to say, okay, now that we're restarting from new, let's move to these different locations and do these, because we know there's going to be more pandemics, we know there's going to be more issues, and people have more of an understanding of going to this place has certain limitations, whereas people might now start looking into jobs. Is, is my job pandemic proof? That might be part of the mentality that they have. So am I living in a place where if there is a kind of shutdown of the services, how high is the chance that the area I'm in is going to shut down? If I'm living in a town where my my the place that I'm the place that I'm working at is just a few blocks away, where it's a short drive away and my home is here, it's paid for, it's all these things. It's not as big of an issue as if I have to live in Brooklyn and take the train and all these other, so what are the, what are the considerations? You personally, what do you think would the incentives would be for you to actually be like, work with the same people you're working with and they say, okay, we're starting a brand new place, we want everybody in the crew to go there, as many people, or what do you think would happen in a change in the restaurant industry in part with the things that happened with the pandemic in mind and just restarting and rethinking. I, I cringe against the new normal type of thing, but just the new reality that, that we're, we're that's going forward. I think there's some considerations that are definitely different from having experienced this, this reality the last year or so. Well, what you're describing, you see a little bit in some groups anyway. Like, for example, the group I just talked about, uh, Dan, well, the Dynex group, but it's Daniel Balud. I knew a guy who... Um, he was, uh, he started as like a busser. I think at Danielle eventually worked his way up to captain. Then when Barbalud, where I worked, where that opened, he became uh, assistant manager there. And then Danielle opened uh, DB Bistro Miami, and he was he took the GM spot there. So I guess he it was kind of like, okay, we're opening a new place. It's going to be here. This is your salary and all this. Do you want the job? And it was it was a move up for him each way because it was okay, assistant manager. Then this, it's like okay, we'll let you run the place. You know, you'd have to move to Miami. Would you want to do that? And I see this with some of these other groups, too. Like, there's Steven Starr. He's a prominent restaurateur. He has places, I want to say, he's from Philadelphia, but he has a bunch here as well. And I think he has some in, I'm trying to think, Singapore or somewhere. Because there was this woman who I was put in touch with who actually moved to Singapore. And I messaged her, and she's like, oh, I moved to Singapore. Talk to this person now. And then... Um, so, but I think it's also, it's a personal choice. Like, it's like, oh, if you'd like, you can keep working for us and we'll give you a position. However, you would have to move. Would you be willing to do that? And for somebody like me, it would have to be a certain level of authority. It'd have to be a certain level of pay. Like, I wouldn't, I don't think I would move somewhere just to do the same thing. Like, I don't really see the point in it because there's a lot of other stuff I do like here as the city such as it is. So, I, and it, I was going to sort of tie into this last bit too. You, so we talked about my father with IBM. That's basically, that. that was why he moved around because, for those who don't know, my father's from Massachusetts, but he got a job in Raleigh, North Carolina. Then he moved to North Plainfield, where he met my mom. And then they moved to um, where I'm from. Um, he worked in East Fishkill, but that was one of the plants there. And then <coughs> Silas and I were talking before this whole thing started about how um, the, the IBM presence in the area that I'm from is really diminishing, though, because there were facilities. There's one in East Fishkill. There's one in Poughkeepsie. And the East Fishkill is basically closed now. Like, I think there's like a shopping center or something there. And then the Poughkeepsie one is a fraction of what it is, what it what, what it used to be. Like, I'm trying I'd have to look up the numbers, but they said there used to be a really strong presence there. But a lot of those jobs got outsourced, automated, all that. I I knew someone I grew up with. His father's a manager there and they do something with like software cloud development i don't fully understand what he does so they have some presence there but it's a fraction of what it was and 
depending on what the, on the type of work you do, I guess you can still find work with them. But even those people, they said they're worried about being laid off and other things. Um, so IBM has been scaling back and outsourcing and all this. I know their CEO now is actually an Indian guy, and there's kind of a joke about that, about how, like, it, like it's Indian business machines now because there's so many jobs in India versus here. My dad actually had a friend who – from India, who ironically, he actually came here to work for IBM, then he went back to train people in India how to do his job. So, you know, it's kind of ironic, but that, that scenario, I guess, is becoming more and more common. And then my grandfather, uh, he had his job with Air Products, and he moved all over the country because that Air Products, you can probably tell by the name, it's helium, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and oxygen, that's what they sold. And he started, I'm trying to, he was from D.C., but I'm trying to remember, he went to Notre Dame, and I think his first job was in D.C., and then there was a whole story about he was in the Marines, so he's stationed at the 29 Palms base uh, in the desert. That's where my mother was born. Um, they lived in Louisiana. He was stationed out there, and I guess he really he didn't really want to live in New Orleans, but his mentor was like, look, come work for, he, for me here. I promise I'll give you a good position down the line. They ended up moving back to New Jersey. He got the regional manager uh, position. That's the northeast region of the U.S. So he basically saw – he had offices in New York, Boston, Baltimore, this whole area, and then – my grandfather worked for that company his whole life, and then he had, he retired pretty young. He was in his, like, I'm trying to think if he was, like, his, like, mid-50s or something, so pretty young. But it was one of those things where the company was restructuring, and he could have kept going. But he's like, look, I don't like how this is going to go because the way it was when he retired, it was like he basically had, like, semi-autonomy. Like, each region was kind of like its own company within the company, as it were. And then if, if it when the company restructured, he would have basically been in some central office working for other people. I mean, he still would have done well, but I guess he didn't want to do it. So he's like, look, financially, I'm in a good spot where I can retire. So he just decided to quit at that moment. But people also forget that this used to be the norm where, you know, you work for one company, 40 years, retire and die. But people also forget that that's kind of an anomaly in American history. And Jeffrey Tucker, I'd have to find it for you, but he wrote a good essay about this where people forget that the cut, the industry, the, economy used to be way more dynamic. Like if you read Rockefeller had multiple jobs, if you read the people worked in these different steel mills, then they saved money and started their own businesses. They went into partnerships with other people. Like this whole idea of oh, I'm going to work for one company, 40 years retire. That's only been a very recent phenomenon. And it seems like we're sort of going back to that older way of doing things, which some could say is good and bad. I mean, it's less stable and for people raising a family, it's tough. Like, and you know, that my dad certainly experienced this. I mean, you know, he got laid off from IBM after 26 years and, you know, you go from a wife that, that, and a wife who doesn't work, then, okay, my mother had to get a job. He had to find a new job and all that. And ultimately they ended up getting good jobs. I'm not going to get into the details. You know, my parents pulled through it, but it was tough. Whereas for somebody like me, because I'm not married, I don't have kids, it's a little more flexible. If I get laid off, okay, I can just go to something else. But if you're relying on that income to support kids, a wife, um, he paid off the house already, fortunately. But things like that, it's like you're really up the creek without a paddle. Oh. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's some of those memes where it's like my parents are 30 and my parents are 30. Like they're looking at a house. It's that that when Aryan faced yes, no meme when the, 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 the female version of it. And then at the bottom, it's like me at 30. And yeah. uh, it was one who was like a, buying a, some, some bread and some milk. It's like, I'm never going to recover from this purchase. And then I just I just saw another one um, where it was like, oh, another banger. And it's like 11 likes on, on, on the post. And for the parents, it was like thinking about buying a car. So those, those are some of, the, some of the realities and considerations have changed. And yeah, as you were talking, I was thinking, okay, of, of course, kids are one of the ma major things that, that will alter people's yeah. considerations. If you're in a location and you have kids – you are already going to say, okay, I'm going to stay here and deal with the issues that happened. And that's something that did happen in the past. As we mentioned, company towns would come up, business would be good for a certain place, and some technological advancement comes up, then whatever you're doing in that one place doesn't work anymore, or the resources run out, mines get mined out. Those kind of things are realities and things that happen, just part of, of, of existence. But I think one thing that's different here is the thing itself also affected the kids. You know, people are in a situation where it's like, okay, I came here because my kids had better access to schools and certain kind of socialization, but many of the places that kind of took a rather <laughs> more rough term when it comes to directly affecting kids during this pandemic are places that also had a much higher lockdown, shutdown kind of effect to it. They also had certain psychoses going into the kids. And during those other turndowns, it's normally like, me as an adult, I'm in the office and things are not working in the office. Things are not working at work. So 
but I am an adult who chose to have kids, and it's not on my kids' responsibility for me to stop their life because their life was not me continuing mm-hmm. to go on. They were still going to school. They still had their friends. They were still living in that same neighborhood. Their life was still the same, and part of the parents were living, and they were saying, we're living in this way because I don't want to have my kids go through something major change their life. Mm-hmm. So I think with this, that makes this kind of pandemic rather unique is it's affected across the spectrum. If places like New York City had found a way to just keep the schools open, and to me that was one of the things that was like, it was one of the, to me that was one of the D-Day things that really made me think this is going to be a much bigger change. I'd already thought at the start, like, oh, this is going to be massive, but what are the things to look forward to? And part of my early videos, I might link someone below this, were the things where I was talking about, like, okay, it's going to be massive. It's going to be some massive changes coming. I don't know exactly what it is, but once they shut down the schools, I was like, ah! Oh no, they shut down the schools. Like people don't understand the like, schools, one of the major reasons they were maintaining is the momentum. You had to keep the kids in there. Like that's why even summer is a, a kind of a questionable thing to take kids out of school for three months. And I'm yeah. already like, hmm, take them out of three months and then see how most kids kind of think about going back to school. They're like, hey, we've been all this free time. But to shut them down, that's something that most parents will sit down in an area and go through hell and high water in order to maintain that location because of their kids. But since this already shut down the standard of living for their kids, there's going to be a lot more people that actually consider and think, why am I still here? Why could I reset somewhere else? As you mentioned with, uh, with the, the, the woman that runs the place, she's older. So in certain places, there's going to be older people who are not affected in many spectrums of their life yeah. We'll be like, okay, this one part changed, but everything else, I'm still happy with it here. So there's no need for me to look into other places. But the younger people that are more socially and things integrated, I think they might have more things that they might decide. And we think, we think <clears throat> it's going to be a lot easier for a kid. For, we for think their priorities. Yeah. If, if you lose your job and your, your kid's been going through school for an entire last year and they still have their friends and still going, it's, it's going to be hard of you to say, okay, let's move to somewhere else and start there in this bigger place. But then I think there's a, there's a, lot, there's a lot more families that, that might consider that now. Well, I was going to say with my parents' situation is kind of interesting because they moved there in 85 because, you know, my dad had the job with IBM. I was born in 88. I'm the oldest out of four, for those who don't know. And it's interesting because it's one of these things where it was intended to be a starter home. But, of course, they ended up staying in it. Uh, I, you know, I grew up in a two-bedroom raised ranch, you know, decent house, not huge. I mean, growing up with three siblings, it felt pretty cramped because it was two bedrooms. So I had to share with two boys because, you know, the girl gets her own room. Um, it is funny now, though, because it's uh, – it's just my brother who plans to move out soon. So they're going to actually have like a pretty good sized place to themselves. And it, it's, it's funny. Cause like I said, it was originally going to be a starter house, but like once will is out there, they're saying like, it's too big. We're going to sell it. Cause my dad, it's like, you know, he, he's in good shape, but he's like, look, I don't, you know, I don't need all this space. Like, why am I going to pay to heat and air condition a bigger house, yeah. more property taxes? Like, you know, he still works in the yard, but like, it's a, it, worry about fixing them. Yeah. It, it, and that, that happened with one of my great uncles, uh, too. He, when he was alive, they had this, like, I don't know if it was a mansion, but it was a huge house. He married my great aunt. It was from a wealthy family. So they had this really nice house and they used to love to entertain, but it was, it was a more extreme version of the same situation. Like, I, I wish I wish I knew like the size of it or something. It was this beautiful like huge house, but it got to a point where he was getting to like 70 and 80. He's like, I don't need all this space. Uh, you know, the heating, AC, electricity, you know, going up and down these big staircases, it's like, why am I paying for this? And on a smaller level, I think a similar thing is happening to my parents where they're thinking about moving to like the town of Poughkeepsie or something, get like a little house where it's okay. It's a little closer to where my other brother lives in his home, but it's like, they can still have a garden, but it's not a huge yard that they have to maintain. Um, it's a little closer to Poughkeepsie. So like the train station, um, there's more restaurants and other things there. So it's like, it's a little smaller of a space, but it's like, they're going to get a better value for the house that definitely for selling it because a lot of people are moving up there. So they're going to get some money. Um, again, not going to get in details, but my grand, my, my, um, grandfather left some money too. So they're doing all right. Um, uh, we, we were, we really went through hell though. My mom often talks about how 2001 was like the worst year for her. Cause nine 11, my father getting laid off. Then my aunt Carol, her cancer came back like all in one year. So that was just like the year for hell. But you know, I commend my parents. They did a very good job. I mean, you know, they were sweating money for a time. I mean, my mother got into some trouble. She even told, she like, she's been more open about it recently, but they ended up getting good jobs, turning things around. Um, 
my grandfather had money, but they're they like, look, we're not going to rely on you. We're going to take care of this ourselves. Um, you know, they, they, I give my parents a lot of credit. They really pulled through that situation. And, you know, fin financially, they're in a much better place. I told them once my investments really take off, I'm going to hook them up too. you know, it's only fair. And, um, and uh, fortunately, too, my grandfather had that Wildwood house. We were able to vacation, which was really nice because it's like basically free beach vacation. I mean, yeah, obviously you have to pay for food and other things. But but it's like, you know, when my dad was laid off, we were still able to have a beach vacation each year. Whereas, like, you know, we couldn't have afforded staying at a resort or something. There would have been no way. So, you know, it's one of those things. Like, at the time, there were certain things I complained about. But my parents really, you know, they, they I commend them. They, they were in a really rough patch, and they pulled through. And, um... <laughs> You know, they got good jobs. My dad retired fairly recently. My mother's probably going to retire pretty soon. Um, like I said, I, the inheritance, I'm going to hook them up to. So, um, you know, ultimately it was one of those like, you know, the night is darkest before the dawn moments. But it, it, it's really nice to see that whole turnaround. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's a good example. Okay. So now we're yeah. thinking about those are, are very practical and it is what it is. It's those those issues that they were going through. Cancer is actually cancer. That's something that really yeah. kills people immediately. We're not wondering is this a thing. If you literally don't have a job, <clears throat> the job the company's closed. The company's literally closed. It's not going to reopen. You're not getting that job back and things like that. There's yeah. this certain bills you have to pay. You have the kids in that situation. So that was more of of an average thing around our age group, which is like 30s and towards the end of my 30s or in your early mid 30s and things like that. That's that's around. They were around that age at that time, right? Like forties, thirties, forties, right? Middle age. Well, yeah, well, yeah, because you figure my dad, what he had me when he was, he they got married older, I guess. I mean, my dad would have been thirty eight when he had me, and then this would be two thousand one though. So that was what thirty eight plus, for no, he was like fifty something. So, but like. He um, and that was a challenge too because IBM was laying off a lot of people in that age group, and then it's tough because okay. you're that age. It's hard. It's harder to get work because it's like they want younger people who will work for less. Number one, um, and the other thing too is that like people want people who will work there for a while. And if you're older, that was a challenge my father went through too, where they're like, you know, do we want to hire someone for a few years who's just going to retire, or do we want someone who will work for less but we can invest it in and they'll stay with us? decades yeah, okay. that's a challenge so what i'm trying to get at is those were very practical and tangible issues that they had to go through little threats and things yeah. like that and then working through them kind of made them actually closer to the location that they're in value that place and make those decisions and things like that mm. with the pandemic as we've mentioned it's different realities where the thing was the thing the the pandemic is nowhere as dangerous as some if somebody's like oh i have cancer even if somebody has covid it's nowhere close to to somebody coming in with a with a cancer diagnosis, the chances yeah. of it killing you off are entirely different. There's a small group of people, people in their 70s, the older group of people, but <laughs> for most people younger, I think there's maybe been five deaths in the United States of America of people under 20 or something who didn't have a lot of other uh, major like uh, comorbidities, like yeah. high levels of obesity or ha being or having some heart palpitations from a kid and things like this. Just Generally, typically, physically healthy people without medical conditions of ages below 60, like your survival rate of it, is entirely different from even the most benign of cancers. So those are very tangible, realistic things, I think, in my estimation, compared to what was happening with COVID. And people maintained, have people have lived through that and stayed in certain locations and soldiered through it and gone back to life. There was no situation where it's like, Oh, you're not in work, or there's a threat because the 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 health ministry says it, or we're just going to reopen your business and you're going to go back to work. And on top of that, you're not getting all these social services and things like that. Most of the many people during this time who were out of work were also getting kind of um, stimulus, kind of getting some kind of support on unemployment and things like this. A lot of people, I think there was a time a few months ago or something I saw in the United States of America, I got to the point where that last month of that last time they were checking was like something like 75% of the income that had come to people was was somehow involved through the state and like, hey, it's horrific. That's a lot of, of yeah. money. Okay. That's not something your parents were dealing with. So maybe my whole estimation that a lot of people will leave certain locations due to, due to the threat, due to the issue, due, due to the problem might not necessarily work. Think It might not necessarily apply to the same kind of situation since the threat itself, the things they were going through, weren't as terminal or tangible as what something like you mentioned your parents going through. Yet your parents still stayed through despite, I think, more 
tangible, substantial um, reasons to leave or more, more tangible and substantial things that had affected their inability to live the quality of life that they had there, that was more like an end of a show versus I think a lot of people might have lived more in a situation where in their mind, it wasn't the end of a show, end of a movie, end of a series, end of a track of their life that they had to restart a new story. It was more like an end of a season where it's like, okay, we're in hiatus until the next season comes back, but there's going to be a next season. A lot of the people were thinking, they weren't thinking it's over for me in New York City, but there was a lot of, oh, we're just on pause. Like we're just waiting for the funding to come. And then once we have a script and we're going to start a new thing, we're going to, we're still going to have our positions acting in this thing. So we're just going to get back. So for a lot of people, it might be, they might be just coming back and saying, okay, we're just going to fall back into our different roles as these characters in this same story that we were telling yeah. versus in the past and in other situations mm-hmm. there's been more significant things where you have to restart a new story if that makes any sense i don't know well it's interesting <clears throat> it's interesting you should say that because i've sort of thought about this with my own life as well like i mean i said you know coming here wanting to be a chef then i decided i didn't want to cook anymore and i started doing front of the house then you know, the, the, my job being shut down, I dabbled in investing because I thought, well, I have some money. I have all this free time. Why don't I do something productive? And I kind of laughed out. I'm like, I've been out of work a year, but financially, I'm in the best state I've ever been in. <laughs> um, so I was like, you know, it's ironic to say. But, you know, I mean, I, you know, of course, I, I find it's not just I mean, I don't know. I mean, again, not going to get too personal with the, the numbers, but like a proportionate to what I started with, I've done pretty well in terms of returns, but also like, I find it interesting. Like I just like learning about markets and how this stuff works and what affects prices and all, I guess my interest in economics and just kind of being a nerd in general. But I sort of feel like what you're saying about the seasons, like this is a new season of my show. Like, do I go back to restaurants after this or no, I'm, I'm considering other options now because it's like, well, if I have the money, what I'm considering, what I'm seriously considering doing, if this goes very well is get back into restaurants but as an investor but what i'm thinking about doing is i don't want it to be like it's not going to be my primary source of income i'm going to do like what a lot of these other types do like for example my old job batello in jersey city uh i can send you a link beautiful place on the water uh there's like 10 different investors there but i'm thinking of a situation like that where it's like i own some piece of it i get money from it i you know i come in they take care of me but it's like i don't have to be there all the time and i'm not relying it on, on it as my main source of income i'm thinking of some sort of arrangement like that where it's like okay, I have a stake in it, you know, obviously want it to do well, I won't have a say, but it's like, it's not like, okay, I have to be there around the clock, because it's like, you know, I want to do the financial stuff, I want to do these videos, I want to do other things, like, I don't want to feel like, I don't want to say a slave to the place, because I'm, you know, they're paying me, obviously, but it's like, I don't want to feel so beholden to that place, and that's what I thought about in my own life with this career, it's like, you know, I mean, I've had the great jobs, especially as a manager, but it's like, there's also a certain point where, like, you're so beholden to the place, like, your days off, you're getting calls constantly, like, you know, they'll ask you about, like, what happened, you know, on my day off, all this, like, you feel like you're kind of chained to the place, whereas, I'm looking to create a life where it's like I have the freedom where I can pursue other things, but at the same time, I still have a stake and, you know, still keep involved because I do love the restaurant industry, no question. So I'm sort of that's sort of like the start of the new season for me trying to figure out, like, how do I want to proceed in this formula? Uh, yeah, I think I'm, 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 I'm glad to, to have been able to have this conversation with you about that, because one of the one of the primary things I think you you'd mentioned how that or the whole company town thing was different. And I don't know when yeah. that whole idea kind of started. It might after World War, after World War Two, well, yeah, yeah well, because my grand mind. my grandfather, you figure he was a kid during World War Two, so but like I think some of those like the GI Bill that was like kind of that era, so like it would have been like the generation right before him, and then like that up until like eighties, nineties, maybe like yeah. early two thousands. Yeah, uh, that's what I was thinking in my mind that that yeah. might have been yeah. part of of what started this. There's an artificial nature to certain yeah. things. In yeah. certain industries, yet one of the things that's a that's a go to industry is the food. Like people need to eat. Uh, some people yeah. can cook. Some people can't. It's something that's there's always a demand for for food. So to to see how the restaurant industry goes in and out is something that 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 is. It might be a rather telling, a rather good example to yeah. kind of uh, understand the way uh, industries yeah. are working in the world, the, the health of the of the, <laughs> the world. But um, I was thinking with that. If you think of post World War II, that's after Europe had been bombed out and dilapidated. Yeah, um, yeah, there was a lot of demand. A lot of the people who were still very capable from Europe were still moving to the United States of America. So there was a lot of people coming in. There was, of course, a lot of government investment in, investment into things. I'll bring fiat currency into this one as well. We had switched off the gold standard. Uh, people were coming into government, started to regulate certain things and demand. So for a time, there was 
an ability for a few people who have the <clears> investment <throat> to really come down and be in one location that is already in a situation yeah. where they have such a big leg up on everybody else to get this kind of resource and provide this kind of thing to the people that they had the a, a natural monopoly of sorts just from being there first yeah. and having the ability and tools. So you had the ability to say, we can do this at this one location because there's not going to be enough competition. The people who are able to actually do the thing are not in a situation where many of the places they were at, when we're talking about, let's say, the Europeans and things like that, didn't have the ability. So they had to move anyway. So a lot of people were, had a lot more of mobile of a mindset. You had the ability to attract the people to those locations, set routes, and then build up. But that was still already a natural thing. And then once you have that, the state comes on into that situation and mutates that issue and starts doing the regulations and setting more beneficial situations for those. And then you kind of calcify in this location and grow up like this cancerous thing, but it's not actually growing and innovating as other people are trying different ways. And then mm -hmm. eventually this pandemic might have been the final death blow to that kind of mentality and expectation. Whereas now you're getting to the point because as we talked about in the first, I think the first full conversation series that we're doing was the you are what you can see when we're talking about how restaurants used to be. It used to be just people opening little inns. It was that's why they're called inns. They're called hats. Like people, yeah, the family yeah. themselves would just open their kitchen to people traveling around, and then you yeah. would live like uh, upstairs and over the house. So it was that kind of thing where that could be something that could come back. I think that would be an amazing thing. A lot of a lot of the people in the restaurant industry you've seen right have now done online process. First of all, the a lot more people are a lot more comfortable with getting even high level food delivered before it yeah. was like pizza and fast food. But now people are a lot more people are like more into like, yes, we can have a full like five course. Even the Michelin star, did any Michelin star restaurants do the delivery stuff? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't okay. think so. I don't want to say I know for certain not, but I wouldn't think so. But a Michelin star. Now that's, that's a Michelin star restaurant is a destination place where you'd be like, I will yeah. drive two hours to go to the Michelin star restaurant. Yeah. And yeah. in New York City, as you were talking about, we're talking about the mobility kind of situation. A homeless person doesn't really have that many situations. Some people are more stuck in the location. But a lot of the people who have left New York City already, I think you look at the average in McDonald's on <laughs> in McDonald's in America, in, in New York City, and the clientele of that average McDonald's, the demographics that go there, maybe one one to two percent of those people have decided to leave that area. Some of the top restaurants the average clientele of that area, 25% of those people might have moved because they're more mobile. They have other yeah. homes. They can move around. They have the ability to do that. So now with those places, they might have the places to go around. And then you have now these places more online or people are used to moving around. So there could be some major change coming in the food industry and other industries coming in where we go back more to that kind of <clears throat> lifestyle where people are online. You can come, instead of just being a restaurant, you come and so people can instead of having a, the Culinary School Institute in New York City as well, you have these smaller schools say, okay, you can come here for the summer, you can come and intern with us for three months and you can learn different ways of cooking. And this could be now a thing that appeals to someone and someone's like, before they were thinking, I personally don't want to, uh, don't want to cook at home. But then now that the pandemic happens, people are like, okay, I like cooking more. I started watching these cooking show. This one restaurant that I liked before, one of the chefs from there now has a cooking show. I like his cooking show. Oh man, they have like a kind of like two month thing or a two week kind of thing where I can go there and live in this small town and and learn from this guy in his restaurant. And then these people decide to do that because they understand like now that I'll send my wife there or I'll go there, then I'll be able to come home and be able to cook now. And I'll be able to actually make meals from these people. I'll just work with like those HelloFresh type of things where HelloFresh has a deal with all these restaurant groups that have these separate restaurants that you can either go to those towns where those separate restaurants are and learn from the chefs. And then using HelloFresh, every week they have more and more shows and you can cook along with the chef type of thing. So that's just something I'm already thinking just off the top of my I, head. I, I, have a, I have a number of points to make on this. So yeah, there's actually ahead. something like that exists uh, called the Heirloom Kitchen. It's a place in uh, Jersey where it's like you can come in and eat, but the chef also does cooking classes. So it's like you can either come in and order food off the menu or he'll do classes where he teaches you how to cook those dishes. So it's like there's people who will do both. Like they'll come in and eat and they'll be like, oh, I enjoy it. How do we learn? And then certain days, I guess, the sous chef runs the kitchen, then he does the classes. So like that's kind of a cool theme. Um, 
There's some other interesting ideas I've thought about, especially lately. In, in Austria, there's something called a Heuriger. Uh, the place I used to work at, it was my third job in the city. It's closed now. It's called Eddie and the Wolf. That was modeled after a Heuriger. It's a little unusual in the city because typically it's a country place. But what it is is um, these wine producers will produce wine, and then they'll open a restaurant, and they'll sell food to go with that wine there. So, like, it's it's kind of a cool theme. And I'm wondering, like, what sorts of ideas like that could you do? Again, it's not a hoi rigger exactly because it's like it's in the city. And but one of our investors, he was Austrian, he was a wine importer, so he was able to sort of like tie some of that in. But I'm wondering, like some of these country areas, especially with people moving out into these areas, if you you could do something similar to that. I mean, they talk about microbreweries. Some of them have their own restaurants. Like I think more and more things like that. Um, my brother went to SUNY Binghamton, and if you go to that area, there's a lot of places like that. Like there was a place. We went for beer, um, I think it was called Farmhouse, and it was like a similar concept. Like, it looks almost like a beer hall, like the wooden tables and stuff, but they have a lot of local beers. Like, I tried one made with beets. That was pretty interesting. And um, they have food there. So, like, concepts like that, it's kind of – this place wasn't in Binghamton itself. It was nearby, but it was one of those, like, small towns. But, like, Binghamton itself is, like, a small city, and then there's, like, the country area too. So I'm wondering if you're going to start to see more and more of these types of areas because people have said that oh, Williamsburg is kind of becoming – I'm sorry, Williamsburg. Binghamton's kind of becoming, like, Williamsburg because, like, all these hipsters and, like, coffee shops. They have a few speakeasies <laughs> that my brother brought us to. Like, but you do wonder, like, are more and more of these things going to start to become the norm in various towns? Like, there will be some speakeasy down the street. There will be this – farm to table place that sells beer to go with it like i think i think it's very exciting i think there could be things like that and um you made me think of there was a place i used to go in my first job in the city it was actually called stumble in it's a play on both the words stumble and i and n two dollar beers on wednesday nights which you know when i was making close to minimum wage was like a godsend <laughs> <laughs> and um I, you know it, it was funny because i went with uh my friend abram they, they have a few other places that one is like down the hatch one is called off the wagon one is called the 13th step things like that i've kind of outgrown them though because i go now it's all college age people and i'm just like i don't have anything in common with these people uh, but you know you come to the city you don't make much money it's kind of nice my cousin went to college near there too so for her it was a similar situation um and then the other two points I was going to make is it's interesting because you're talking about restaurants not going away. I've invested a bunch in AMC, and that's the point that comes up, too. People still want theaters. Like, that's not going away. I mean, there have been issues with the, you know, social distancing. And some people, I guess, they're checking for vaccination cards. You don't need a mask, things like that. But people still want to go see things on the big screen. People still want to go to IMAX. Like, you can't recreate that in your home. So, like, that business model is not going to die and then you have things like the Alamo. I don't know if you're familiar. It's a theater chain started in Texas. You can probably tell by the name. There's one in Brooklyn where it's like you can get food, but not just like food, but you can get like cocktails brought out to you. You can get like small plates, stuff like that. So I'm wondering like what's the potential for things like that? And I know they were talking in Wall Street about doing like a high end version of that. Like you can get champagne and stuff as you watch your movies. And I'm wondering like things like that. I mean, there's so much that could be done, honestly, I think. Yeah. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. tidying the food. Food is a, is a, is a mm -hmm. key thing that there will definitely yeah. still be a demand for it. You can have a situation where you tie stuff like, and like, it's good to me. I think another thing theaters can look into now, like gaming itself is a big industry itself. You can have like different tournaments and gaming nights where people do like uh, events where you just go there sometimes and just have a whole bunch of people. I think I've, we might have mentioned this in a previous conversation, but you have like an area where maybe there's a Cinemax with like, some of these Cinemaxes have like 20 theaters. It's like way too many theaters. I'm like, that's, that's a lot of rooms. But you have this kind of thing where you maybe, maybe take 10 of them and just put smaller screens in them. Then you have people and saying like, okay, instead of you playing your games online, or you can play your games online, but you can be playing different people online, but this is access. It's kind of an arcade situation where people can come in and play and you have different tournaments. And when you get to the higher levels of the tournaments, you're playing in the massive screens on the, on the, big, tele, on the big theater screens because the actual quality of those video games is not like, beyond hd like some of the stuff that's coming out is a like pure cinematic just gloriousness that's coming out with these games like i just saw the preview for the new um for the new new horizon game even though they kind of <laughs> the, the argumentation they made for changing Al alloy's face was was a bit eh for me but like anyway <laughs> they, they had those issues but you look at those tv so you can have that kind of thing where it's not just movies but you can have like gaming kind of tournament nights where people and people enjoy watching people game Instead of just that, you can have other things like we're talking about with the cooking things. You can have places where people come and they want different things. So there's ways to tie those in, most most definitely. Um, uh, I, I got to send it to you, but it sort of relates to this. Um, 
There's a really funny uh, meltdown. Jim Cramer from uh, Mad Money, you know the financial guy, where he yeah. was getting troll. He was getting trolled by these Wall Street bets people on Twitter. <laughs> so I guess he just blocked a bunch of them and this like went on a rant on TV about it. And he talked about ideas for GameStop, and he was mad because I guess um, he didn't get any credit like for some of his ideas, although they, they never implemented them. But um, because of the short squeeze with GameStop, GameStop was able to raise, I think, like half a billion dollars or something, and they basically saved themselves. And But he had an interesting idea about um, some of these, like, because, you know, a lot of malls, they talk about the malls are dying, but what they should do is open gaming facilities where there's gaming facilities that, like, like, you know, more intense arcade games that you need to be in person to play. But he had yeah. ideas about, like, paying the winners in cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Dogecoin. I thought that was kind of an interesting idea, like some something like that where it's, like, you have to be you have to be in person to do it, but there's an actual reward for doing it, so it's worth it. And I was thinking about this myself because he brought he brought up in another um, discussion how GameStop's fundamentals are tough right now. Because if you think about it, with like things like Steam and everything, you can download games directly. Like there's no reason to buy a physical copy. Like I haven't bought a physical copy of a game in like at least a decade, probably more, because there's no point. It's like you download it to your computer. If you don't like it, you want to install it, but it's saved in a cloud, so you re-download it if you want to play it again. You don't need the physical disc and, like, change discs and all this. Um, and then his point, his other point was, like, the hard, you, like, if you're buying a gaming system, you still need the hardware, but you can get the hardware from a lot of other places. So to have a store that just focuses on that is kind of tough now. But, I mean... I think people still like arcade type stuff, so you could do something like that. Like you'd have to develop it further, but I, I like that idea with the crypto and like you know some type of arcade type thing or tournaments or there 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 are things you could do for sure. Yeah. I was thinking, with the kind of idea also as we're talking about with the restaurants, there's certain experience about actually being at the restaurant for certain yeah. things. Like yeah, some high level cuisines, how they're presented in a certain order yeah. and a certain ambiance that adds to it. But there's still really good food or really quality food at a certain point that can be done re from your own kitchen or in other locations that, that don't count too much on the ambiance or special ingredients. I was thinking, instead of like franchising McDonald's and restaurants and things like that, how about franchising recipes? Franchising like kind of chefs and stuff like that, where like someone can, like you said with the same training thing, where somebody comes in and uh, they, they train with that guy, like you said, in, in Jersey, and then that person can go around different towns and things like that. You can book him ahead of time, like, oh, I think this probably already happens already in some kind of way. It's like, oh, we're having a wedding, so uh, we'd like this chef from who has learned the recipes. Someone has graduated from this chef's place, and you went one time to this one chef's restaurant, and you had this really excellent meal that's made at this restaurant in, in Jersey, and then you know there's like 50 people that have studied that recipe from that chef. Now you're having a wedding, and you say, okay, I want this, so let me hire these people. to Let me hire two or three of them to come in my restaurant and then they actually work and while they're in the place there's there's a there's a there's a restaurant set up in that area the same way there's kind of arcades with high level um with high level what's it called high level uh, cook like ovens and cooking appliances and gets actually gets a, a set delivery for really good quality foods and things like that then you book some place in that for like a week since you're going to be there and working for this wedding anyway for um you, you'd be working this wedding anyway for that weekend you might as well go there and maybe a week or month or whatever you move there and you say okay i'm going to be working out to this kitchen that has a food court with different places and then people from that neighboring area instead of saying i have to plan a trip all the way to new york this might be somewhere in montana they say okay this chef who's worked at a few and learned a few recipes from the places in new jersey new york city mm -hmm. area is going to be at this one central location so i'm going to come here for some time and I don't know. They, they could be a way to, to tie that well, in. I, I, I think we talked about it a while ago because you were talking about this idea like a chef's for hire type thing. And that's actually one of the sous chefs from my last job did where there's like a profile. You have a profile on a website where it's like this is the person's resume. This is how much they charge for the services. And then obviously if you have better experience, they're going to be able to charge more money. But it's like – oh, I'd like this person to come and cater my bridal shower or something. Yeah. It's like, you know, and then it's like maybe you have to pay for the food or something, but then they can come in early, you know, they can hire other people if need be. They set it all up and it's like you can do it in the person's home even and it would cost a fraction of what yeah. you would if you had to rent out a place. So there's things like that. Like if you have – you know, I mean, like my parents' house wasn't huge, but if you have like a decent home where you like to entertain people, we'll just hire a person to come in for the day, pay them a salary, you know, again, maybe – either reimburse them for the food or something and then just say this is exactly what i want and then they do a good job you hire them in the future you recommend them or things like that yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. 
Because mm -hmm. renting out some of these places is expensive. Batello, my old job I talked about, that's how they make most of their money. It's from caterings. Caterings are way more profitable than a la carte service. So it's like they have these weddings where people will pay like 50, 60 grand for like one day. But you think about that, you do that over and over. It's like that really adds up. Whereas with a la carte, pardon the expression, it's a crapshoot. You just, you sort of prep a bunch of stuff. You anticipate we'll sell roughly this much. We may, we may not. Whereas with catering, you know, okay, there's this many guests, there's this many options. And then if you don't use the di the dishes you prepped, you serve them as like a special or something. Like yeah. I remember for some weddings, he would like prep, like, like let's say lamb, fish, something else. If there's a bunch of lamb left over, okay, we'll run that as a special the next two days. Sell it out. Good. You don't waste anything. So things like that, you know. Yeah, and that, like you said, but now with with malls shutting down and different places like that going, those can, those places can be repurposed for some of these things because yeah. not just the malls themselves, yeah. not just the, the the restaurants themselves, the food courts, other places, other other stores and other locations can be used for similar things, changing and affecting in different kind of businesses. Like now, instead of having <clears throat> things locational limited, you can have things that move around and just rent the space, and then. You have the shared costs of the people investing in this one location, and then instead of saying, "Oh, we just need a J.C. Penny that's going to have a nine month, like a like a ten year lease," you have a situation where it's like this is an area in the space that's able to sell clothing. So all these people who are these fashion designers selling these small little strains and things, and so yeah. instead of having one location where they go through these main centralized places, you have these more decentralized, more limited things where it's like, okay, you can buy a rack for some time and say, okay, I'm going to have a rack. You're some YouTuber who has millions of views and say, okay, my stuff's going to be at this store in this location for this time. I don't know, there's, there's, there's ways. There's well, I, I've been discussing with my parents. I mean, the whole brick and mortar thing is just going out of style because it's like, I mean, I'm the type, like, I kind of like buying clothes in person because I like to try them on and stuff. Yeah. But, like, other things, I mean, like I say, video games you download directly. Um, the, for the movie theater, you go to the theater, but, like, streaming, you do that at home. Um, you know, if you got a, like vitamins, a lot of them I order through Amazon and other places like there's just there's not as much incentive to like go to a physical place like like where I grew up. The mall was like 20 minutes away. So you get in your car, you drive, you go come back. It's like time walking around a list. Whereas, OK, I have this supplement that I like. Go on, pull out my phone, Amazon order, send it to my house. It's there in a few days. And it's like I it takes a few seconds versus going there and back. And it's like. You know, as we say, I mean, time is money, time preference, all this. It's like, why take the time and energy to go to a place? And then the other side of this is from the point of the retailer as well. Like, why pay this money to rent out all this space? A few people come and shop, and then you're just paying rent, and you may not make that back. Versus, okay, if you have, like, an online business or something, you could produce stuff out of your home, out of your garage, coordinate with people, have it shipped, and it's like – you don't really have to spend that much money, the cost of materials, and then they're paying for your skills, essentially not, you're not, you don't, they don't have to pay for your rent and all these other things. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh. Uh. Hmm. Okay, so we've been, we've been talking for about two hours now. Yeah. And it's, it's been a wide range of topics. I, I don't know if we should call it, at least for this recording now, we can still stay on and, and talk about stuff. It, it's, it's up to you. I'm flexible. I, I didn't, I didn't have much plan. I was probably just going to take a shower and go eat dinner somewhere. So I okay. didn't really, you know. The place you go to eat dinner was that place that was closed, or the place that was open? Or um, I'm debating where I want to go. I've been there's a few places I've kind of been a regular at lately. Um, Minetta Tavern, I like this French place. It's really rich food though. It's like I, it's one of those like I go now, I get like one thing because it's like too much. But they have like the I don't know if you saw the burger I posted. It's um they have a burger. It's made with four cuts of beef. It's dry aged, so it's like short rib, skirt steak, uh, chuck, and there's one other. Um, and it's made with uh, caramelized onions made with uh, Jim Beam Black Label. It's really nice. And things like that. And then I tried. I didn't post a pic yet, but I had lobster thermidor there. It's an old school French dish. Not many people do it anymore. Um, I tried vol au vent. It's, it's this really old school French dish. It was funny because I... I posted it and someone was like, what is this, France, 1972? Because it's like <laughs> puff pastry, escargot, sweetbreads, really good, though. And Oh, and there was a uh, garlic parsley butter. But, yeah, it's like old school French stuff. It's pretty rich. Like I say, I used to go in there and get a lot, but now it's like I just feel like death after. So I'll get like one thing or I'll get like a few appetizers. But um, it all tastes great. But I'm like, I can't eat like this all the time. So I'm debating on that. I like last night I went to a place called uh, Huertas. It's a uh, Basque tapas style place. I love that style of food because small bites. So I sort of eat it like based on how I feel. So I'll be like, like I'll get a few things. I'll be like, OK, am I still hungry? Ah, maybe one more and then I'll stop. Yeah. Whereas like with something like Mineta, like the food's great, but it's so rich. It's like I'll get one thing, maybe two if I'm hungry. But it's like I, I still have to try the desserts there, but I'm usually too full by the time uh desserts come it, it's really funny dessert by itself. 
Yeah, come back, come in. I want to try. They have a Grand Marnier souffle. I want to try that actually. It's cool. Apparently, they um, it's one of those like you have to order twenty minutes in advance, but um, it's one of those things like they kind of flambe the top of it. They say it's really nice. They have a chocolate and a Grand Marnier. I want, I want to try it, but like I'll probably come and get like an appetizer, a small entree, and that. That's probably my thing. It's typically for two people as well. But it's like kind of a bigger thing, but I mean yeah. it's light and air. It's light and airy, so it's like I don't think it's that filling. Because because souffle souffle means to rise. It's a lighter dough. The egg whites are what causes it to rise. So it's not a super rich thing. If it was oh. like a brioche, if it was like a brioche cake or something, I couldn't eat that because that's like eggs, butter, milk. It's like <laughs> that would be too much. <laughs> cool, cool. All right. So you need to remember what you go get to eat, and then I think we'll we'll we'll, we'll open the next conversation with that. And sure. um, so I don't know. I did this. This I guess we'll, we'll just we'll just sign off here and um, yeah. Thank you all for listening. Like as I mentioned yeah, at the start, and I probably put another intro at the start. It's this. This is this more of a. We hadn't recorded for some time. As I mentioned, we had one recording at the start of um, around towards the start of the major shutdowns. And as yeah. I said at the start, there's going to be some COVID stuff. Some of the stuff was COVID related. Some of the stuff was general. But this was mostly just to to get back and have a conversation. Stephen hadn't recorded anything with him for some time. I'm still getting to the point where I have the last part of posting of. The Why We Believe in Gods, haven't gotten that up yet. Need to get that up. We'll, we'll get that up in a few days after recording this. This part probably come out after that part. But then we have a few other series that we're going to have to converse. This series of just general, more open, free conversations, I think we'll be doing more of these. If it's okay with Steven, I'll be glad to just do more of these. There was something that happened. We had to take a pause and other things came yeah. in. But we have a lot more content kind of in mind. And uh, <laughs> thank you all for listening. As yeah, thank you. This is more general. Some of the stuff is more planned and topical. And we'll come back. There's more questions that have on different topics about particular to do with the actual pandemic related stuff. I think like Stephen has lived in New York City. He's talked to a few people who a few people in our circle of people that we know have moved. So we'll we'll keep following that with Stephen and see if he moves as well. I have some plans of later on in the year, kind of coming back to the States and moving back to the States for hopefully for more permanent things. So I'll start talking more on the developing of that. There's more temporary things that might get Stephen back on to record next yeah, couple sure. of days, specifically about the revelations that came out with Fauci and some of the considerations might get more into like conspiracy theory, conspiratorial type of things with what happened stuff. specifically with those unfolding things about that. So um, any anything else you want to say about this conversation or things coming forward? No, I enjoyed it. I think these personalized conversations are good because, um, you know, Jeffrey Tucker has written about this too, how like that's why autobiographies sell the best because people, there's something, it's personalized, it's personal, that's what makes it interesting. It's like, it's our own experiences, our lived experiences. Whereas yeah. like, if we're just, I mean, I enjoy reading the books obviously, but there's a point where if you're just kind of citing someone else's material, it's like, it's better just reading this stuff and like the commentary is good, but like, I think there's something about a person's experience and, you know, maybe you knew you learned things about my life, my parents' life that you didn't know. I mean, you learn more about the industry and, you know, I, I just think, I think these can be very interesting topics. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, same here. I enjoy having these conversations. I'm glad to be able to have them with Steven and I'm even extra glad to be able to share them with you who are deciding to listen. And I appreciate y'all taking your time to listen to these and have some things in mind I would like to expand these kind of things where, because I think I've been privileged to know some rather cool people. And I think if some of the people knew the people that I knew, they would not be as worried and concerned about certain things. They might be enriched. They might feel a certain different way about other things. Some of the collectivism that I see, some of the limitations, some of the judgments, being overly judgmental about people, expecting certain things, or we are this group, that group is not us. I haven't really been able to buy into many of those kind of ways. I think that's in part due to my lived experience, but um, just from getting to know people like Steven, getting to know information about him, and there's a few things he mentioned here that through our, uh, what, uh, five years or so of knowing each other now, there's yeah. still a few new things that I heard about. And, and this is something that I think I think will be, will be interesting to do. And I, I'm foreshadowing this, I want to set up a kind of system where I set up just a platform where people can use this kind of construct to have get to know people it's, it's a rough idea of it being called it's like i know great people and we've talked about certain things just talk about re regular conversation that kind of a thing where it's like we have this conversation then off the same platform steven has a conversation with somebody else and then it's kind of a thing where you can like click okay you, have, you like this conversation with steven. this is steven talking to someone else this is steven talking to someone else and i kind of want to get in a situation where eventually you go into that situation and then you like oh you click and like this is steven talking to 
talking to my mom? Like what? <laughs> you know, where you just figure out like, oh, you thought you, you heard somebody who had a really good conversation with somebody and then you follow the tree and you find that this person knows somebody who you know, who knows somebody that you know. And then it's like, hey, we actually all kind of know each other and we're all talking about the same kind of situation. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's it for me. Anything sure. else to say? That's all I have for this. Okay. So goodbye, people. Bye, Guys, thank you. and everything else in between. And Steven, stay on for a little while. Yeah, that's why we found